So dear participants and dear guests, uh, welcome to the Nutrition for Healthcare Professionals Achieving Healthcare Through Diet Conference, which is organized by uh, Sabrul Care Foundation and the Nutrition Society of UK. It's my great privilege to welcome you all here in lovely Istanbul. With the Nutrition for Healthcare Professionals uh, Achieving Healthcare Through Diet Conference, which will, which will be held for the first time in Turkey, we will draw attention to the critical importance that balanced nutrition plays for the future of public health, together with you, our esteemed participants. Thank you all for not leaving us alone in our new project, which is extremely important to us, and for sharing our excitement. First of all, I would like to briefly talk about the work of our foundation. As the Sabrul Care Foundation, we have been working for, with the mission of raising awareness and contributing to the establishment of healthy nutrition awareness by transferring the most accurate and reliable information uh, in the area of food, nutrition, and health to our society since our establishment in 2009. With the sense of responsibility, we add new projects around the world to our activities every day. As you follow closely, as the Sabril Care Foundation, we have implemented many projects such as the Balanced Nutrition Education Project, Sabril Care Foundation Publications, Science Talks, uh, and, and many more. We have reached 8 million children so far with our Balanced Nutrition Education Project, which has been implemented in 20 different cities since 2011 to raise healthy generations and has become widespread with the addition of new cities every day. With the Science Talks platform, which we established in order to raise awareness in the society against information pollution related to healthy living, we publish articles, scientific publications, and researches uh, focused on healthy life and nutrition prepared with information from internationally accepted reference sources. We have reached 10 million people in a short time with the Sabri Care Foundation publications, which is also another proud of ourselves, which we established with the motto, let everyone read, in order to inform the society correctly in the area of nutrition and healthy living. As the Sabri Care Foundation, we continue on our way by adding world-class stakeholders to our ongoing efforts to convey the right information in the areas of nutrition and health to the society with the most accurate methods. One of them uh, is our conference on nutrition for healthcare professionals that uh, we open today will continue tomorrow as well. As the Sabril Care Foundation and the Nutrition uh, Society UK, in this great organization, we will host world-renowned scientists in order to better understand the role of nutrition in achieving ideal health and maintaining a healthy life balance. We will share with you the recent researches and studies. We will discuss subjects such as the role of nutrition in maintaining health, nutrition at the COVID, uh, during COVID-19, immune function and health, public health in initiatives for obesity and diabetes in Turkey, and uh, mainly hidden hunger subject as well. At the end of the conference, which will last for two days, we will prepare a statement by preparing the urgent actions to be taken for the future of public health at the roundtable discussion session to be held with the participation of our esteemed speakers. So thank you once more, again, not leaving us alone in such a great organization, and thank you for listening to me as well. So with uh, great pleasure, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Julie Lovegrau to make her opening speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Began. Uh, good morning and a very warm welcome to um, this conference, particularly to our delegates that are joining us online virtually around the world and also to all of us here in these beautiful surroundings here in Istanbul. My name is Professor Julie Lovegrove and I'm a director of the Hugh Sinclair Unit of Human Nutrition at the University of Reading in the UK. I also have the privilege of being the president of the, of the uh, Nutrition Society of the UK and Ireland. And it's a great honour for me to uh, be invited by the Foundation to give an opening address here at this exciting conference. Just as a way of introduction to the Nutrition Society, for those of you who aren't familiar, we were uh, founded in 1941 by 27 eminent scientists, academics um, and policy makers and are one of the largest societies, uh, learning societies for nutrition globally. 
with uh, nearly 3,000 members around the world from about 87 countries. We organise about six conferences annually um, with a focus on either undergraduate students, postgraduate students and full conferences in the summer, spring and winter. We also publish six internationally renowned journals and our flagship journal, the British Journal of Nutrition, is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. We also publish six seminal textbooks which are used with, um, by students globally and translated into five languages. The Nutrition Society also has its own training academy uh, with a number of offerings of classroom-based but more um, recently online webinars uh, which are there to upskill our particular early career researchers. The Nutrition Society is within the United Kingdom positioning itself as a really trusted organisation that can give advice to government organisations um, and, and, and other policy makers. We have a large global reach, but it is our ambition within the Nutrition Society to increase that international collaboration. And our ambition is to have a number of global um, hubs of centres of excellence to increase the um, recognition of the importance of nutrition globally. And it's for that reason we're actually absolutely delighted to collaborate with Sabra Ulka Foundation for this conference entitled Nutrition for Healthcare Professionals, um, Achieving Healthcare Through Diet. This is our first collaborative link um, and we're hoping it's not going to be our last. This is timely for the Nutrition Society because we have made a major contribution to developing of an undergraduate curriculum for medical students in their training to highlight the importance of nutrition. We have a number of objectives of this conference, but the main one is inspiring healthcare professionals to better consider the importance of nutrition in prevention and treatment of disease. We have a number of eminent scientists here uh, that's going to give some really uh, inspiring presentations. The program is really exciting and I am really looking forward to the next two days and I very much hope you also enjoy it. Before I finish, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to the organising committee for this program, to Sabra Ulka and Began for uh, your support and vision for the program and for your financial support of it. Uh, we thank you very much for that. So I do hope you enjoy the conference. Uh, thank you very much. So with my great pl pleasure, I would like to uh, welcome Professor John Matters uh, for his keynote speaker. But before I invite him, I would like to say a few words about him. Of course, uh, there is lots to say about him, but I will keep it short as much as possible. And John Matters is the Professor of Human Nutrition, Director of the Human Nutrition Research Centre and Director of the Centre for Healthier Lives in Newcastle University in UK. And his major research interests are in understanding how eating patterns influence risk of age-related diseases, including heart disease, diabetes, dementia, and bowel cancer. Please let me introduce you, uh, Professor John Matters. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, and, and it's a delight to be here at this uh, exciting inaugural conference linking Nutrition Society and the Sabri Ilker Foundation. So in this presentation, I'm hoping to cover three areas. Firstly, I'll give you an introduction to why nutrition is so important for good health. And then I'll go on to speak about one particular area where poor nutrition has an adverse effect on health, and that's the impact of obesity. And in the final part, I'll give you some thoughts on where I think nutrition research should be heading in the next 10 to 20 years. So let's start with the big numbers, the reason why we're here and the reason why we're thinking that nutrition is really important for health care. These are data from the uh, Global Burden of Disease uh, analysis showing that in a typical year uh, at least 11 million deaths are due to poor diet and there's a very large morbidity often measured as disability adjusted life years uh, associated with poor diet. 
2017, that was estimated to be over 250 million years of morbidity. And those effects of poor nutrition are across the globe. It's not just in wealthier parts of the world or in the poorer parts of the world. It's in all countries of all uh, uh, levels of economic development. And it affects all aspects of health. These are the big ones which relate to mortality. So cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancers, and so on, largely the non-communicable diseases. And it's many aspects of diet that matters. It's not just one thing that we get wrong. There are many components of diet that uh, affect it. So diets that are very rich in sodium or containing too little in the way of whole grains or too few fruits and vegetables and so on, all of these contribute to poor health and to the uh, burden of mortality. And it's a very similar picture if we look at morbidity. It, these again uh, affect health and well-being across the globe in countries at all levels of development. These data from the global burden of disease analysis are likely to underestimate the total effect of poor nutrition, partly because of the lack of good data on dietary intake in many parts of the world and also because of the lack of good data on some of the non-communicable diseases which are associated with uh, poor nutrition. And this is an extensive problem. Uh, these are analyses carried out by WHO, the World Health Organization, which suggests that uh, in the area of $7 trillion is lost uh, to the health system globally through poor food and poor nutrition. Similarly, a big impact from malnutrition, so undernutrition and overnutrition, and uh, particularly obesity, and I'll say more about that one in a moment. So just focusing for a moment on non-communicable diseases, and these are the major uh, non-communicable diseases to which humankind uh, is exposed. And what we've learned over the last 20 or 30 years of research is that these diseases, which seemed to be rather different, different in their nature, actually have many things in common. They have a common etiology, and nutrition has a major impact on the risk of each of these conditions. So it's not just increasing our risk of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, which have long been understood, but now a recognition that most of the common cancers, at least 12 or 13 common cancers, are all influenced by nutrition, as is chronic respiratory diseases, such as COPD, and increasingly evidence that dementia risk is influenced by nutrition. Not surprisingly, strategies for addressing non-communicable diseases involve uh, factors related to food and nutrition. And I've starred on this uh, summary slide some of the areas in which changes in nutrition contribute to strategies for non-communicable disease uh, prevention. So these range from providing information, education and skills, to work on health-enhancing environments, such as improving the food supply, restrictions to marketing, and that's pretty obvious in some parts of the world through restrictions, for example, on uh, marketing of high-fat and high-sugar products to children. Fiscal policies, so trying to change behaviors, not only of individuals, but also of companies through changing the tax structure, and of course, providing good information through label, labeling and packaging to enable individuals to make choices. The problem is that we don't implement these policies at all well. And this is an analysis of the extent to which uh, the WHO policies for non-communicable diseases have been implemented around the globe and looking at trends, I beg your pardon, 
looking at trends from uh, 2015 through to 2020. Not enormous changes, and you'll see that those that I have indicated by red arrows, which are nutrition-related policies, are been implemented pretty poorly across the globe. Now, in the UK, uh, we use the Eat Well Guide as a way of encapsulating the healthier attributes of the whole diet. Uh, and this indicates the uh, proportions of our total diet, which are recommended to come from different food groups. So you see the largest component in green here are fruits and vegetables, and then other plant-based foods, whole grains and so forth, with much smaller amounts of uh, animal products, uh, meat and dairy. Recent analysis of data from the UK suggests that we're not doing very well. We've had this kind of recommendation for more than a decade, and so far we are not improving our diets a great deal. This shows you the uh, extent of adherence to each of the components of the Eat Well Guide, and you see that although the majority of the population is doing reasonably well in terms of salt and fat, we're not doing well in terms of eating enough dietary fiber or oily fish, and most of us eat much too much sugar. So lots of room for improvement. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the manifestations of poor nutrition is the development of obesity. And this is a, 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 a manifestation which has profound impacts on health and well-being across the life course. The McKinsey organization did an economic analysis of the impact of obesity a few years ago, and you'll see that in terms of the cost, obesity was estimated to come number three after the effects of smoking, armed violence, war, and terrorism. So this is a large societal problem, um, which is nutrition-related. And it matters because obesity contributes to poor health in, in many, many different ways. And this slide illustrates some of the health consequences associated with obesity. So increased risk of chronic respiratory diseases, kidney disease, fatty liver disease, problems with the musculoskeletal system, as well as the more uh, uh, well-recognized problems with the cardiovascular system and diabetes, and of many, many cancers. And increasingly, we're recognizing the impact of obesity on mental health. Levels of obesity have been rising through the last generation, the last 30 or 40 years, quite markedly. And this uh, map illustrates the prevalence of obesity by country globally for men on the left and women on the right. And levels of obesity have been rising just about everywhere around the globe in that time. And in some countries, it's now extremely common with more than 50% of the adult population uh, living with obesity. And that increasing obesity contributes to both morbidity and mortality. This plot shows you the uh, disability adjusted life years, that measure of morbidity that I talked about earlier, uh, globally in 1990 on the left and in 2015 on the right. And you see the, the, the increasing contribution that obesity makes to poor health around the world. And it's very similar if you look at mortality. This shows you the numbers of deaths according to BMI category again in 1990 and 2015. The major causes of death being sorry, cardiovascular disease, cancers and uh, diabetes. Low and middle income countries are not immune to the increasing uh, levels of uh, obesity and sub-Saharan Africa has been experiencing a rapid transition uh, where we're seeing a rise in uh, 
obesity levels in most of those countries. Now, whereas in Europe and uh, most of the uh, Western world, obesity is associated with uh, poverty, the opposite is the case for most sub-Saharan countries where uh, in most cases, but not universally, those who are better off have higher levels of obesity. So this is a feature of this nutritional transition. And my prediction is that we'll see that changing because already we're seeing that those people who are more highly educated in sub-Saharan African countries have lower obesity than those people with less education. So this is a transitional problem. I want to just focus for a moment on obesity in childhood. And this is a rather stark statistic from WHO from 2014. One in three children living in Europe living with overweight or obesity. Those are data from 2014. Just a few weeks ago, WHO published their latest analysis of obesity across Europe. And this is looking at overweight and obesity among children by country for children who are less than five years of age. And you'll see that although in some cases, uh, in Turkmenistan, for example, uh, and Tajikistan, less than 5% of children are uh, overweight or obese, that rises rapidly in many other countries. So, for example, in Ukraine and Albania, 15 or more percent of children under five living with overweight and obesity. Now, this really matters because it isn't just a problem for the children when they're children. This carries a long legacy. Being overweight or obese as a child increased your likelihood of being obese as an adult. And this is an analysis from five nationally representative longitudinal cohorts from the United States involving more than 40,000 adults and children, showing you that the likelihood of being obese at age 35, so in uh, uh, young middle age, increases with uh, those who are uh, obese in childhood. And obesity and overweight in childhood contributes to the risk of cardiometabolic disease and mortality in adulthood. These are data from a systematic review carried out by John Riley and his colleague a few years ago. And those who were overweight or living with obesity in childhood had a much greater risk of all the, cardi all the common cardiometabolic diseases, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and stroke, and it was associated with a greater risk of premature death. So if obesity is not good for health, what about losing weight if you're obese? And there's been much less work done on the impact of weight loss, largely because achieving weight loss in people who are obese and achieving it in the in a sustained way is challenging, but the evidence is accumulating that weight loss in those who are overweight and obese improves health and well-being in the long term. And I'm going to start with an example from type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is, uh, these are data from the direct study, and you'll hear much more about this study this afternoon from Professor Lean. And what we saw in the uh, direct study was that when individuals with type 2 diabetes were encouraged and able to lose weight and to sustain that weight loss, then they, uh, their diabetes went away. And these are data for the first year of the trial, showing you that for those individuals who managed to sustain a weight loss of at least 15 kilograms, 86% of them were now free of diabetes and off diabetic medicine. We've seen that that's also been sustained for two years, and Michael, I'm sure, will tell us much more about this trial uh, this afternoon. Now, what we eat is not the only thing that matters in terms of obesity. Uh, and analysis 
from uh, genome-wide studies have shown that there are more than 100 genetic variants which contribute to uh, our likelihood of being overweight or obese. And these are scattered across the, the genome. And you can see they're on all of the uh, chromosomes. I'm going to focus just for a moment on the uh, gene which has the single biggest effect in the general population in increasing the likelihood of, of obesity. And this is the FTO gene. This gene has a number of variants, but those that are found in the first intron are associated with uh, weight gain and with increased adiposity. And particularly if you carry the AA genotype for the SNP at RS9939609, then you're likely to have a greater risk of being heavier and a greater risk of obesity. So we wondered whether that genetic risk influenced the likelihood of being able to lose weight. It seemed intuitive that something that made it easier to gain weight might make it more difficult to lose weight. So we set up a hypothesis to test, set up this hypothesis and tested it using the FTO gene. So to do this uh, study, we reviewed the literature systematically to identify all those intervention studies where there was data on weight change and change in other markers of adiposity and where the individuals had been genotyped for FTO. When we carried out this study, there were 11 such trials and uh, those who uh, ran the eight largest trials all agreed to collaborate in an individual participant meta-analysis which involved nearly 10,000 individuals. And what we saw was absolutely clear that across all of these studies there was no impact of FTO genotype on uh, weight loss. You see, all of the values are very close to the vertical line, indicating that genotype did not influence weight loss in these weight loss trials. We adjusted all of the analyses very carefully to take account of all of those factors which we thought might contribute, uh, might influence the extent of weight loss. And none of those ha had an effect. And we had similar findings for body mass and for waist circumference. So at the end of this study, we were pretty confident that our hypothesis was wrong. In other words, that genetic susceptibility that makes it easier to gain weight is not an impediment to losing weight. And I think that's a really important public health message because some people are very fatalistic about their genetics. They think that if you have a genetic factor that contributes to some health outcome, that you can't do anything about it. I think what this shows us is that that's not the case and that changing behaviours and improving diet uh, can help us to lose weight. We've done this analysis for FTO which has the single biggest effect. We'll wait to see if that applies for the other genotypes but I'd be willing to bet money that it will. So let me turn now to another very popular area of uh, that's related to weight loss, and that's time-restricted feeding. And there's a great deal of uh, interest at the moment in restricting the, the duration of the day during which we eat meals. And this 16-8 split has been talked about as being a very healthy way of eating. And the idea has arisen that if we only ate during eight hours and fasted for 16, that might be more effective in terms of managing body weight. Well, that hypothesis has been tested in a big-scale study very recently. This is a trial carried out in China and published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks ago. And in this study, the participants in the trial were randomized to one of two treatments. In each treatment, they had restricted energy intake, so about 25% less energy than normal. And in one case, they were also subjected to or encouraged to uh, time-restrict their eating. 
so that he only ate during an eight-hour period and fasted for the other 16 hours. And the question the researchers asked was, would that time-restricted eating make the weight loss more effective? And the data are absolutely stunning and very clear. There is absolutely no difference in uh, weight loss with time-restricted uh, eating. The critical thing here was that restricting energy intake helped people to lose weight regardless of when during the day they ate the food. The researchers also looked at a whole range of cardiometabolic outcomes and they showed very similar changes with both regimes. So what can we do about weight loss in the general public? And I'm just going to mention here the droplet trial, which was carried out by Susan Jeb and her colleagues. And this adopted a, a dietary approach that was very similar to the one which we used in the direct study, which I imagine Mike Lean will speak about this afternoon. So to help people with, uh, living with obesity to lose weight, they underwent an eight-week total diet replacement followed by a gradual reintroduction of normal foods with the intention to enable them to change eating behaviours in a sustainable way. And this was carried out in primary care to uh, develop an approach which could then be rolled out at scale. And in the droplet trial, what they saw was that compared with the usual care, the total diet replacement uh, approach led to much faster weight loss and much more sustained weight loss over the full year of the trial. So I think this offers an opportunity to, to take weight loss into primary care and to be highly effective. Let me turn now to uh, another uh, issue related to poor nutrition, which has become very apparent in the recent pandemic, and that's the links between obesity and COVID-19. And to illustrate that, I'm going to show you some data from a recent systematic review and meta-analysis, which involved about three and a half million individuals. And what it shows is that all of the aspects of the disease were worse in those people with higher adiposity. So the risk of uh, being diagnosed was greater, the risk of being hospitalized was greater, the risk of having to go into an ICU was greater, there was also greater risk of invasive mechanical ventilation, and greater risk of death among those who had higher BMI. Now, when these data began to appear, people seemed terribly surprised, as if this somehow was a new discovery about an adverse consequence of obesity. And of course, it shouldn't have been a surprise, because we've seen this all before. I'm showing you here data from the 2009 pandemic of uh, influenza the uh, influenza which was caused by H1N1. And what this shows you is the risk of being hospitalized or dying from influenza according to uh, adiposity category. So those people with, who were obese or morbidly obese had a substantially greater likelihood of being hospitalized or dying from influenza. So we shouldn't have been surprised that another respiratory disease had a similar manifestation. And indeed, at that time, there was quite a lot of work done on the ways in which obesity contributes to the inability to defend the body against uh, respiratory viruses. And in addition to the way in which obesity reduced pulmonary function, there was already good evidence of the way in which it uh, reduced uh, the immune capacity to defend against the virus. So we shouldn't have been surprised, but somehow we were, when COVID-19 had similar effects. Now, of course, uh, obesity is not the only way in which nutrition could affect uh, the, the risk of obesity or, sorry, the, uh, affect COVID-19 or uh, affect how we um, recover from the disease. 
And there was a lot of interest in uh, vitamin D as a potential modifier of the course of the pandemic. I think the evidence is pretty clear that when we get to the stage of people having the disease, big doses of vitamin D don't seem to have any benefit. And this was a, a, a clinical trial where individuals with uh, moderate to severe COVID-19 were given a big dose of vitamin D3 and there was no effect on the course of the disease. Now within the British Union of Nutrition, we uh, provided a service to the community by commissioning a number of articles on the potential mechanisms through which nutrition might influence the risk and severity of COVID-19. And we brought these together into a special collection and they're free to read on the website. So if you want to read more about the ways in which nutrition might influence other aspects of COVID-19, I encourage you to have a look at this. So in the final part of my presentation, I want to turn to the future. And it's always a bit risky to predict the future. So these are very much my personal views of what I see as priorities for nutrition research. And I'm going to start with the climate emergency, because I think whatever we do, we have to do it in the context of uh, major global climate change. It's clear that our health, the health of human beings, is intimately connected with planetary health, and we can't see those as separate, and the effects on change in climate, biodiversity loss, problems with water supply, problems with degradation of soil, all of that contributes to poor nutrition. And predictions have been made about the impact of climate change in this century on uh, Europe. And what I'm showing you here are the predicted increase in climate-related deaths uh, across Europe in uh, the 21st century. A small amount of this increase in deaths is due to change in population structure, because we're getting older as a, a society, but the largest part is through climate change. The factors which contribute to obesity and undernutrition and other manifestations of poor nutrition are also uh, drivers of climate change. So we need to see this in an integrated way. And I think this is a big challenge for nutrition research because it means we need to get out of our silos and start collaborating with others to uh, address this global problem. We will need to change the way in which we produce food uh, to help to contribute to keeping global warming below two degrees. That means changing the amount of methane we produce from agriculture, reducing uh, nitric oxide production from agriculture, and we need to see the uh, landscape more as a sink for CO2 than a way of generating CO2. It's likely to lead to changes in the way in which we produce food, um, and this is leading to research on components of sustainability in different farming systems. And this particular analysis looked at uh, conventional versus organic farming and showing you in where each of these has advantages and disadvantages. So I think we need to look carefully at the way in which we produce our food so that we can do that sustainably and we can help to address the climate emergency. But individual dietary choices also matter. Um, and this analysis from a group in Oxford showed that uh, the choices we make around food, particularly the amount of animal products that we consume, could make a big difference to uh, the environmental impact of uh, food production. And this is because animal products are major and growing contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And so there's been a, a move towards more plant-based diets and a recommendation that plant-based diets 
could be uh, healthier for the planet and maybe also healthier for us. But not all plant-based diets are necessarily healthy, so it's not just a matter of leaving out meat or dairy, it's a matter of making good choices. Uh, and this analysis from the health professionals follow-up study and the nurses' health study uh, showed that looking at uh, coronary heart disease as the outcome, that while a healthy uh, range of plant foods can contribute to lower risk of coronary heart disease, uh, less healthy plant foods can actually increase risk. The Eat Lancet group have produced a healthy reference diet, um, and it's uh, illustrated on the screen at the moment, which is designed to be beneficial not just for human health, but also for planetary health. And the idea is that this provides ranges for individual foods uh, which are compatible with good human health and also compatible with uh, protecting the planet. Most of the evidence used for this came from links between diet and cardiovascular disease. And we wondered whether this was relevant and whether this dietary pattern also was important for other health outcomes. And so as part of an ILC working group, we've been looking at the Eat Lancet reference diet in relation to cognitive function across the life course. And what this analysis revealed was that there's huge areas where we have very poor or no information. So suggesting that these are areas where we need more research to be confident that this kind of dietary pattern will protect brain health um, across the life course. The next priority in nutrition research that I'd like to talk about is how we make changes to individual behaviours. And the current public health approaches are relatively ineffective. Um, you'll probably hear more from this, about this from Alison Tedstone tomorrow. Um, and we need to have some new approaches to changing behaviours. And there's been quite a lot of interest in using precision or personalised nutrition approaches to achieve that. And precision nutrition is central to the NIH strategy uh, for nutrition research for this decade. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on this because the uh, USA is a global leader in nutrition research and so we should pay attention to what they're suggesting might be important. They have big ambitions for precision nutrition and in this uh, JAMA editorial, Rogers and Collins argued that precision nutrition is the answer to what to eat to stay healthy. And so what they're proposing is that the NIH will invest in very detailed work on many of the components which influence dietary behavior and the response to diet so that we understand what would be relevant for individuals and how we might help them to change their diet. They're investing heavily in this area and earlier this year, they announced an investment of $170 million in a precision nutrition series of studies. I think time will tell whether this is a, an appropriate approach. There's certainly a great deal of interest in this. Um, and if you want to read more about it, um, the National Academies uh, Food Forum recently published this workshop, which again is free to read online. To finish, I'd like to say a bit more about nutrition and brain health, because I think this is a frontier with great opportunities for nutrition research. It's an area of unmet clinical need, and it's very clear that uh, obesity and depression are closely linked. At the moment, it's far from clear what the direction of causality is but it may well be that it's a two-way process and that obesity contributes to depression and those with depression are more likely to have poor behaviors leading to more obesity. I'm going to focus mostly on brain aging uh, and 
the manifestation of brain aging, which of course is most uh, important to society, is the risk of dementia. And the predictions are that the global burden of dementia is going to increase markedly in the next 30 or 40 years. The plot on the right shows you the increasing number of individuals who are predicted to be living with dementia for men and women. So it's a growing problem and there are no good pharmaceutical uh, solutions to this problem. There's growing evidence that obesity contributes to brain aging. And this analysis from a group in Cambridge shows you that uh, brain volume changes which are associated with aging and associated with dementia risk are exacerbated by obesity. And those with obesity have a brain age approximately 10 years greater than their chronological age. And diet really matters in terms of brain health. And healthier dietary patterns, such as the Mediterranean diet, are associated with better brain aging. I'm showing you here a systematic review and meta-analysis uh, re carried out recently looking at the risk of Alzheimer's disease according to Mediterranean diet adherence. So this pattern, healthier dietary pattern, is associated with lower risk of the commonest form of dementia. We've been interested in the ways in which a Mediterranean diet might influence the aging process and in particular brain aging. And in this uh, recently published uh, review, we identified components of the Mediterranean dietary pattern or of the whole pattern uh, as a total which impacted on all the biological processes which contribute to aging, all nine hallmarks of aging. We can't forget the gut microbiome and nutrition influences this part of our body. What we consume has a major impact on the gut microbiome and probably consequentially on multiple health outcomes. I just want to focus for a moment on uh, brain health. And there's growing evidence that our gut microbiome influences the uh, gut-brain axis and many aspects of brain health, including neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, and also neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric diseases. The mechanisms are still uh, relatively poorly understood, but they're likely to involve both metabolites produced by the uh, gut and impacts on the immune system. So in this lecture, I hope I've convinced you that nutrition is central to health across the life course. I've shown you some of the evidence about links between COVID-19 and nutrition, and that we should expect that to be common to many respiratory conditions. In my view, what we do in research on human health cannot be and shouldn't be separated from concerns about planetary health. And I think that nutrition and brain health is a high priority for future research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Now uh, we are moving to the session one, uh, the case for nutrition education. And I would like to welcome Professor Erki Vertianian and uh, for his speech uh, on the power of interventions, the example of Finland, the North Karelia, Karelia project. So I would like to give uh, a few, spend a few words about him. Uh, he has been a professor and assistant director general in National Institute for Health and Welfare in Finland. The main responsibility of his department has been non-communicable disease prevention. His main research interest has been cardiovascular disease prevention and uh, by risk factors and lifestyle changes. So he will be the chairing, he will be chairing the session one and sharing the stage with Professor Sarhatunal as well. And he will be our chairman of uh, this session. 
Please uh, welcome Professor Erki Vertiane. So, good morning. It's um, nice to be abroad after two years being only in Finland for this COVID, COVID um, pandemic. To, today we are talking about the, basically on the North Karelia project, which was the cardiovascular disease prevention program in Finland, but more broadly about the dietary changes in Finland, because the North Karelia project was uh, officially, it was a five years program from 72 to 77. And then there has been like a, like a, use of the experiences in, in, in Finland and in, in some other, other countries. Here is Finland and the North Korea is the most eastern corner of Finland. It used to be a very poor area, agriculture area, rural forest industry. And uh, this was our problem in 1970s. So in Finland, among middle-aged men, the coronary mortality was uh, uh, about uh, like 500 per 100,000. 100, and in this slide, you can see that in Japan, at that time was lowest when the same number was about, about 50 or, or, or 60, so about 10 times difference. Some of the background of the program. The seven country study was started in 1955 and one of the areas was North Karelia. And in this study it was recognized that the mortality among those seven countries was highest in Finland and especially in, in, in North Karelia. And also the risk factors, blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking were very, <coughs> very high. There was also the public attention to high cardiovascular mortality. So the population recognized that young men at the age of 40 and 50 were dying for coronary heart disease and also stroke. So the local people recognized that there is something wrong in our society. And based on these two observations, this scientific seven country study and people own observation the local people in North Korea, local community leaders and political leaders decided to go to Helsinki to talk to the prime minister that something must be done in the, to solve this problem and the people in North Karelia alone cannot handle this situation. Based on this, it was decided that, that there should be a special program and then was involvement of the Finnish expert and all, also the WHO. So from the very beginning, the, our international colleagues were helping us in, in, the, in, in the designing the program because at that, at that time the expertise in this area in Finland were very poor or it doesn't exist. There were two main questions in 1970s. Can risk factors and behavior be changed in the population level? And if risk factors will reduce, what will happen to the mortality? At that time, the discussion was that perhaps these risk factors are not the causal factors. There are just, uh, they may be just risk indicators. And, and uh, some of the eminent professors at that, that time in Finland said that there is no enough evidence to change the behavior of the whole population. And we don't know the risks. So there was a debate inside in Finland also, should we start this program or, or not? This is the basic uh, strategy in, in cardiovascular disease and also many other NCD prevention. The individual risk is in the red line here and you know, you, we all know that it's, it's continuing, so there is no natural threshold for, for the risk. 
and this is the risk factor distribution, if we are concentrating only those who are in high risk to this 70, this, this part of the risk factor distribution, we can effect a relatively small number of coronary cases. We have estimated with the present uh, treatment guidelines, it may be about 25%. Most of the cases are coming to the distribution, which is, which is average, but it's not treated as a medical, medical problem. So the only solution is to reduce the whole distribution to left. And that was the rational background for the community program. We have not to change only those who are in high risk, but we have to change the mean value of the, of the risk factor distribution. Here is some theoretical, uh, theoretical principle of the intervention. It was the medical framework, so it was primary prevention, main target, smoking, diet, cholesterol, blood pressure, population approach, general risk factor reduction, emphasizing lifestyle changes. M many of these things are not medical, they are also those sociological or psychological, so we have this social behavioral framework, social marketing, behavioral modification, communication, innovation diffusion, there are community organization. Then I pick up a few examples about the, oh, this one more slide here. Here's the behavioral modification framework we were using. To change the behavior, there must be first the knowledge. You need to know that smoking is harmful but we all know that it's not enough to change the behavior. There must be the persuasion or motivation. There must be a practical skill, how to stop smoking, how to cook healthy food. There must, must be a social support. It's easier to change the diet in the family if the whole family is changing that. Then there must be the environmental sub support. For example, if the... Uh, unhealthy food is less expensive, then it's a, it's a, it's a social, it's not a social support. So the healthy food should be also uh, less expensive. And community organization is related to the factors, what are the norms and rules and how things are organized in the, in the community. Here's the Practical intervention, emphasizing persuasion, practical skill, and social and environmental support for the change. And there was a research team, and then there was also a local program team. And the main area was a lot of media activities, preventive services, primary health care, training for prof professionals and others, environmental changes, smoke-free areas, and so on, and also the monitoring and, and feedback. One of the key elements in the health services was the hypertension register. It was the computer-based, and there was a hypertension clinic in each health center or each uh, municipality in, in North Karelia. And the nurses were in the key position, so they were doing most of the work. So they were measuring the blood pressure, giving the advice, and if needed the drug treatment, then they are consulting the medical doctors. And also the, the invitation letters was sent once a year to the people to come to the clinic for high blood check. So it was not up to the individual person to be active to go to the clinic, but the clinic take, take, take the responsibility to invite the, the patients to the clinic. Uh, NGOs were in a critical po position Hard foundation in if municipalities and villages were very active organizing different different things. Setting strategy: we have different program, schools, work site, media, family, health centers, villages. So the basic idea was to involve all the infrastructure in the community to this this work. Then I pick up a couple of, couple of practical examples. This is the innovation diffusion theory. I think that you, you all know that, that the, how the 
innovation is, is spreading in the, in the society. And uh, in the beginning, beginning, there are these innovators. I think those people who are in, uh, decided that there must be, who sent this petition to the Ministry of Health, so they were the real innovators. What about this uh, uh, early adapters, how to get those involved? We went to the small villages and asked from the local people that who are the most, who are the people to who people trust in village. It was, it's, it was relatively easy to get the number of people who, who were more prominent. There were official or unofficial prominent people. And we invited them in a training seminar for a nice hotel, actually with their families. And the only thing was that we were describing uh, the program and the ideas and the main messages, and then ask them to discuss about these issues in their normal life. If they're teachers, with the pupils, if they're shopkeepers, with the, and so on. And there was um, more, more than 1,000 people altogether in, in, went through this, this training. And we have done some evaluation. Here you can see how much the how active they have been in the discussion about the, with the family, neighbors, work, and so on. So they were also very active after the after the training. And when we keep contact to, during the years to those people, early maturity. How to pick those? That uh, is a me my mass media is in key position in this. And in 1970s and 80s, we had like a first reality TV program in Finland. When we invited about 10 to 15 people in the studio group, and they were aiming to stop smoking, change the diet, increase the physical activity, and so on. And this was very, very popular, popular program in Finland. And there was altogether six, oops, sorry, six sessions and um, we have done the evaluation about this so about um, 250,000 people so at least four uh, sessions this is now the smoking uh, data so 30,000 attempt to quit min quit smoking and about 20,000 quit and about 10,000 were smoking after one year of the, of the, of the program. So, so let's say quite effective way to, to change the behavior. Dairy program was important from dairy industry to berry production. And I will go more about this later. And here the helping marketing and pro product development because there was a need to change the dairy to other production and, and it was a painful process so this was one of the one of the tool to help the farmers and it was funding from the from the ministry of agriculture what about the late majority of the luckers we recognize that the highest coronary highest risk factor level was in in small villages in, in North Karelia. And then we developed the idea that let's have the cholesterol lowering competition between the villages. And we <coughs> we provided the, the cholesterol measurements together with the health centers, but then the municipalities or villages must uh, organize all the activities by themselves. Somebody of us what we are talking there if needed, but it was very upstairs. Usually most villages have the uh, volunteer village committee or, or other activities. And uh, the best village, village reduced cholesterol by, by almost by 11% and one village was not able to reduce. But we think about when it's the mean values in the village, it's quite a reasonable chase. And uh, this is the cholesterol reduction by the number of activities the, Chile, where the village was organized. The more active the, the villages were, the more cholesterol reduced. 
couple of examples about the, the intersectional work. The main problem in Finland was that um, in, in diet that uh, the, the milk fat was the main fat used in the country. And there was practically no other, other fats, no, no, no oils and nothing. So the, uh, the farmers and, and uh, the industry developed the rapeseed oil which is uh, growing in Finland. The problem was that we don't have olive oil and, and sunflower oil is so and so, but they developed the, the rapeseed oil which is growing very, very well in Finland. The other activity was that, that uh, by, by feeding the cow in different way, the, the milk is less, less uh, fat. With the food industry cooperation, the biscuit example, the leading Finnish biscuit manufacturer has removed some 80,000 kilograms of saturated fats from their products. And people don't recognize the taste. So you can do a lot of the, lot of the work uh, without changing the date, uh, without changing the taste. Meat example, the, the leading Finnish meat company, they reduced salt like uh, 80,000 kilos, kilos in a year, 200,000 kilograms less saturated fats, and, uh, and uh, the, here you can see the, how they are reduced the salt Content, content in their products. So the cooperation with the food industry is critical. They can do a lot because they can also sell by health. The only problem that you cannot very much uh, change the taste. And there are technologies, as you can see, that it can be done. And there is the Finnish Heart Foundation has a heart symbol which can be put in the, in the healthy, healthy products. Then we have developed a cytostanol ester margarine called Penecol, where we, in the normal margarine you, you add a cytostanol ester and it reduced cholesterol by about 10, 10, 10 percent. So it was also done in, in with the, North, the pilot program was done in the North Karelia people, actually the people who were participating in this survey were part of the, those who were part participating in the risk factor surveys. What happened to the risk factors? Here is the systolic blood pressure reducing. You can see that the mean was very high and in North Karelia the re reduction was faster than in many other er uh, the re reference area, but after that the development has been the same which was actually the original idea that let's, te let's test first in, in one, one province and then use that, use that as a pilot to, to improve the situation in other areas. Similar develop, develop among women, diastolic blood pressure also reducing. It's going a little, little up and down. We can discuss about the reason for that, but basically it has reduced and diastolic blood pressure for a woman, a real reduction. You can recognize that the mean was more than 90 in the 1970s, and that's nowadays the, the, the treatment level for, for, drug, for drugs. Serum cholesterol, about 20% reduction during, during the decades, and again, first in North Korea, then in the rest of the country. Serum cholesterol for a woman, quite a big reduction. Only factor which is going the wrong direction is the obesity. In the, in the beginning of the program, the obesity was, ne, was the title in the, in the topic in the, in the North Karelia project, because it was not regarded as the main problem at that, that, that time. But later we have had several programs to 
improve the situation in Finland, and I have to say that we have not been successful. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know any country or any population who has been successful. So this is like a global common, common challenge for us, and we really need, need like something new thinking in this 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 problem. And this is body mass index for women. Why did the cholesterol decline? Uh, you can see that that uh, butter consumption was re really reduced, and it was really replaced by the margarine uh, or by the butter oil oil products. A very de de similar development among women really, really changed from butter to, to margarine or butter oil products. Use of vegetable oil, so I told about the rapeseed oil, so really increased. That's now the most popular. And so the same for the woman, really increase in vegetable oil. And here is now the nutrient level. You can see that there was about saturated fats was about 18% in, in 82. We have some data from the 1970s when this saturated fat intake was about 25%. So already here it has been reduced. But in this data set, we don't have the earlier, earlier nutrient level data. It has been reduced into about 14%. Not very much improvement in the last last changes. So this is a challenge because the recommendation is still less than less than 10 percent of the energy intake. So this is something we really must work in the in the in the future. And this is very similar development amount among women. Salt intake has been coming down from. 12 grams here to about 8 grams. The recommendation is less than less than 5, so there is still way to go. And here I think the main strategy has been the cooperation with the food industry. Of course, of course giving the information to the people, it's important that people know what it is. But the food industry has been really uh, reducing that. And the main strategy has been that they have to to do that gradually. So if you are changing the very quickly, people are, it's bad tasting. But if you are going down gradually, people are recognizing. The Fatser, which is the big, biggest uh, bakery in, in Finland, we have at the cooperation during years, they have decided to reduce the salt content 0 0.7 uh, grams in this year. And it's uh, because they have tested that people recognize that, that difference. And they have, they're easy to do because it's all industrial things, so they can just turn the, turn the, turn the salt intake a little, little lower. It's not only a question of physical health, health it's also how people are feeling about health, their health and hear about 40% per feeling that their health, health is good or very good in, in 1970s, and now it's uh, about about 80%. It's not. It's only for, for cholesterol and and uh, physical measurements. It's also how people are feeling about their health. Very similar development for for women. What happened to the mortality? You can see that in North Carolina, the Mortality was almost like 700 per 100,000 among middle-aged men, and it has reduced to, to, to nowadays it's less, less than 100, so 84% decline in North Karelia. And this blue line is the rest of Finland. You can see that it started faster in North Karelia, and then all countries following, which is quite well fitting to the, to the risk factor changes also. This is how much the risk factor changes are explaining the change in, in, in mortality. This black line is the mortality statistics from the, from the for coronary heart disease. 
And this is how much the risk factor changes could explain about the change of the mortality. And you can see that in the 1970s, all the risk factor, all the mortality was explained by the risk factor changes. But in, since 1980s, there is a gap. The, risk factor, the mortality is declining faster that we can uh, calculate based on the risk factor changes. And the answer is very clear. It's the new treatments. In 1970s, when I was in medical school, there was practically no treatment for coronary heart disease. And now we have all these fancy things, which is really affecting on, on mortality. Here you can see, here are the role of re different risk factor reduction. You can see that the cholesterol re reduction was the most important factor affecting to the, to the mortality decline. And here is the same analysis uh, in a slightly different way. And here you can see that uh, the risk factors are explaining about 71% of the reduction and the treatment about 24% from 82 to 97. We don't have the later analysis done, but in, in this period, the risk factor reduction was the most important. Similarly, this is based on so-called impact model. You may know developed in Scotland actually, and it has done in in, in many other, other other countries, and also in China, where there has been an increase in in, in coronary mortality. Why did the diet change? I think the North Karelia project like uh, initiated the idea, bring the idea in the country. Gradually, the concept of healthy diet changed. In my childhood, the healthy diet was full milk, cream, eggs, bacon, nothing green. And to change that to, to vegetables, oils, chicken, fish, was a really big change in the norms and values and also in the production in the, in, in the country. So it's not co only question of one individual change, it's a real big change in the, in the society. Consensus in the medical, medical community and nutrition community was critical. critical. There was some debates, there's still some debates on this issue. We have the Nordic uh, recommendation about the healthy nutrition and we are following that. And there are different kind of fashions going on in, 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 the, in the diet and I think in the medical community we should be very strict to believe the science and leave the others less attention. Political consensus was critical. It was done in 1885 where the government said that these healthy issues and healthy behavior, diet, smoking is critical part of the government policy. And based on this con consensus, it was possible to develop the nutrition policy, agriculture policy, tobacco policy, alcohol policy. So to get the policy, poli political, political parties also involved is, is a critical. And finally, the food industry and agriculture got interested and, and, and can cooperate. Okay, thank you for your, for your attention. So now we are continuing the session one, the case for nutrition education, and I will be pleased to invite Professor Sarha Tunal with the speech of nutrition, immune function, and health in the time of COVID-19. Sarah Tunal is uh, from Hajettepe University Faculty of Medicine, Head of Infectious Diseases and Clinical Microbiology Department and Director of Vax Vaccine Institute. Dr. Sarah Tunal graduated from Hajettepe University Faculty of Medicine in 1981. He received specialization uh, training in internal diseases and infectious diseases in Hajettepe University Faculty of Medicine. Dr. Unal also received a specialty training in infectious diseases at the Department of International Medicine at the United States Harvard Medical School, New England, Diakonos Hospital. Please welcome Professor Unal for his speech.
Thank you, Begum. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as a member of the organizing committee, I would also like to welcome you to this lovely city of Istanbul. Uh, be, you can be sure Turkey is almost a COVID-free country at the moment. We have less than 500 cases a day throughout all of the country and no more deaths. And Istanbul is, is really a unique city, and I hope you will have a chance to see uh, uh, all the important places as well, together with this very important scientific uh, scientific uh, meeting. And this one is good. Yeah. Uh, when I say COVID, I'm talking about the transmissible diseases, and these communicable diseases uh, attack people, humankind, during the centuries. Plaque, the first one has been diagnosed, even goes to BC, but the big outbreak is going down to the 10th century. And during those centuries, uh, pluck has killed millions of people. And after that, cholera and then the, uh, the, the smallpox and, and then the, uh, the, the, uh, the malaria, they all are the major killers of humankind during long centuries. And when a transmissible disease kills millions of people, we call it, we call it pandemia. And this classical pandemia could be sold, kind of sold, in the uh, middle of 19th century, I would say, by understanding that clean water is, is, uh, uh, is a good tool to uh, avoid the infection and by the invention of the vaccines and antibiotics. And in, in 1960s, uh, the medical community was thinking that, hmm, that's it. I mean, we could solve the microbiology problem or the infectious problem, but it was not like that is uh, we are progressing, the microorganisms are progressing as well, and a, a second period has already started for these pandemic issues. As you see over here, World Health Organization recognizing Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Ebola virus disease, and Marburg infection, and, the, and then Lassa fever, and the uh, grandfather, grandmother of SARS-CoV-2, MERS-CoV, and the SARS, Zika and uh, underlying a disease X. Not only the World Health Organization, but the, uh, the Bill Gates is also describing a disease X. And he says that if anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to, to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. And unfortunately, we are having same, at the same time, both. We have suffered from the corona and, you know, the uh, war in the um, Russia and Ukraine, and the that disease X turned out to be, uh, as you all know, COVID-19. As an infectious disease specialist, I couldn't stop myself talking about corona a little bit, and then I'll try to combine that with the uh, immunity. And as you all know, uh, everything starts here in Huan, Hubei. Here you see the uh, caves where the horseshoe bats are living. Not only that one, and the uh, coronavirus is the uh, horseshoe bats are the uh, natural host for the coronavirus. And all around there are wild animal farms. As you see, many different kinds of wild animals has been uh, catched or, or grown in the farmhouses, as you see mink over there, and uh, used uh, to, to, to consume as, as a meat because they need that meat. And beside that, as you see in the right, and right, uh, right upper inside, these places are also very attractive touristic areas too. So it means men, the main source and the intermediate animal are meeting, as you see over here, this is a wild animal farm, and those meats are sold in the animal bazaars, as you, as you see over here. So the, uh, uh, the bats, the main source and the intermediate animal and the men are together in an appropriate condition. It includes everything, the uh, humidity, air temperature, uh, the uh, proximity to each other. So in a way, they moved into the human and the corona has adapted human and started to spread out the world. And that is a virus. Viruses goes into the uh, body or the cell. Uh, they uncoat, this is an RNA virus. They replicate and then they put all the parts together and as an old variant, virion leaves the uh, cell comes in one, leaves thousands. And the while it's replicating over here, it makes mistakes, and that mistakes, as you know, cause the mutation. And we could understand this alpha, but 
After all those multiplications, it has gone on to beta, gamma, delta, and omicron. So the each new variant is more transmissible because that virus is adapting the human body and learns how to live together with that. And in a way, is less killing format as well. But finally, we came up to uh, omicron. And when the virus goes into the cell, of course, it damaged the cell, but the cell is responding with the immune system. And there are lots of uh, cells and the intermediate transmitters in between. But the problem over here, the optimal immune response, uh, try to uh, stop the virus, but there is a balance. If it's overbalanced, if it's overexpressed, then what we call uh, the, the storming of the immune system and it damages the body. So the damage to the uh, body through the virus is the uh, multiplication of virus, invasion of virus himself, but the additional damage is coming from our own immune system as well. So when it, if it, uh, since it goes any single cell in the, in the body who carries the special receptor, what we call AC2, it goes to uh, uh, respiratory tract, it goes to gastrointestinal system, neurological system, cardiovascular system, not only the uh, respiratory tract, although it has transmitted through respiratory and makes the major damage here, but it makes damage in all over the body. And the immune system is the key to respond to that. And the, uh, the important things over here, whatever the factors that affects the uh, outcome of the disease is the amount of the virus that we get and the, uh, uh, and the immune system, how it functions, how it responds. If it's an adequate immune response, it's okay. If it's inadequate or overreacting immune response, it goes into the, even to that, as you know very well. And we, all the words, uh, very fastly, we learned how to, we learned the disease, we learned how to diagnose it, and we learned how to treat it. A couple of drugs over here, as you see, hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, and favipravir turned out to be not functioning well, but later we had remdesivir, malnuprevir, and Paxlovid, this is a Pfizer drug, that is very effective against virus. And besides that, we learn how to stop the exaggerated response of the immune system as well to avoid the damage to the, uh, to the body. And nowadays, all the doctors in the world are dealing not acute disease itself, but the chronic or the late onset or the uh, long-term effects of COVID-19. And this is a, will be a huge burden on the uh, on the, uh, uh, the budget of the uh, different countries. It may be start basic, I mean, hair loss that may not be very important, but uh, it may go up to dyspnea, headache, insomnia, depression, or any kind of uh, factors that you see over here. And very shortly, very uh, fastly, we learned how to protect. Wear a mask, clean your hands, keep a safe distance. At the beginning, it was discussed very much, does it really work? But there are lots of studies proving that this worked. And, uh, and then, as I have told you, uh, we learned how to treat it. And then lots of many more drugs are still being developed for this. And the, uh, the most important thing, of course, we learned the vaccine. As we could understand the, how the virus uh, responds, or the body responds to virus with the different cells reaction over here. Uh, immediately, even including a new type of vaccine, what is called mRNA vaccines, we learned that and the world uh, has organized the, or the produced the uh, new vaccines and uh, different kind of vaccines has been uh, established over here, as you see. And the, uh, it was a kind of miracle because it takes at least 10 years to develop a vaccine to any kind of infectious agent. But Word is burning. I mean, you got to do something. And scientific community work together. And all those phase one, phase two, phase three studies or the preclinic studies have been inserted each other. They have been run together. And with lots of cooperations, we could have the uh, vaccine available to use less than a year. And it was a real miracle. And uh, it gives some hopes too. If, if the word wants to success something, it can be done, but the, on the other side, uh, cannot success anything, not avoiding the war, not avoiding the obesity, not avoiding the hunger. So uh, we, it was kind of, at least for me, a kind of hope that is mankind can, can do something because it is a miracle bringing a vaccine out like that less than a, less than a year. 
And uh, at the end of uh, 11 months, there were about 10 uh, vaccines or 12 vaccines ready. And the important point over here, uh, out of this 12, four was coming China, four was coming USA, and only one from uh, Russia. So the, uh, suddenly, the, the vaccine became one of the important tools for the fight in between the countries, a, a kind of power holding the vaccine power in hand. And, uh, you know, the inequality. I mean, there's, there was not enough, there was not equally or the, uh, the uh, equally distributed all over the world. But by the time, by the uh, production of the new vaccines, uh, this problem could also be solved. And during all that period in Turkey, we fight against this disease, of course. Uh, we have uh, followed um, thousands of cases in our hospitals. But the good point, uh, there was not even a single Turkish citizen who could not find a bed who needs to be hospitalized. We had enough infrastructure for that. And there was no Turkish citizens who could not be in, uh, accepted into the intensive care unit or taken into the ventilator. And the uh, uh, best one or not, but we could give drug we believe that it was effective at that time, could be given every single patient. And uh, beyond that, we have contributed for the development of the vaccine studies as well. The first one, uh, the phase three study of Chinese uh, CoronaVac, that's an inactivated virus, has been run in Turkey because USA and Europe did not accept China as a scientific community and the Turkey, Indonesia, and Brazil had to do that. Uh, and the, uh, we were the, uh, First one finished that, and with that publication, that, virus, that vaccine could be licensed throughout the WHO and could be used all over the world. And in Turkey, this was the first one we used, and it saved hundreds of healthcare uh, workers. And we, we really appreciate that help, but we help for the developing of the uh, uh, vaccine as well. At the same time, uh, we, were, we were involved in the uh, development of the Pfizer BioNTech mRNA virus as well. Uh, possibly Turkey has been asked to, uh, to support because the developer or the finding of the, the, uh, the, the people who found the vaccine was a Turkish gentleman and a lady, as you know, and uh, possibly because of that, I'm not very sure, but we were happy to be to involved and we have contributed to a phase three study of those vaccine as well and published in, in uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And finally, Turkey could develop his own vaccine. It is an inactivated vaccine. It's called Turkovac, uh, and uh, we used in our country, but it's, we, it's, uh, the application is at the WHO2. Uh, finished phase three study and ready to be published, and I hope we will be able to publish that in due time. So the, it was a uh, worldwide uh, fight against um, this infection. And uh, dear colleagues, as you know, in a community where there is no immunity against the virus, everybody will get sick. The ones who did not die will become immune against that. But we have to uh, speed it up with vaccine, with that miracle protective uh, tool. And the world uh, worked quite hard. And as you see over there, 65.7% of the world population has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, of course, there was an uh, inequality again. The, uh, the low-income countries could not manage that so high. But everybody did his best prevention, treatment, vaccination. But unfortunately, as you know, it is close up to 600 million cases, and we are talking about 6.3 million deaths. And uh, I was listening to Dr. Mathis and the mothers. He, he talked about the... Uh, um, the, the, debt, the, the number of the deaths, you said 11 million because of the uh, uh, lack of food. So comparing to those problems, it may not be as big as that, but it was a big challenge for the world. And I hope we could slow it down and finish, but don't uh, feel so comfortable. Think about the uh, monkeypox and other possible candidates for that. So the uh, main subject of today, I mean, uh, I do not feel very comfortable talking about uh, nutrition or feeding against the nutritional 
uh, specialist, but, uh, but as an infectious disease doctor, uh, I'll try to make the connection immune system, infection, and the nutrition. As you all very well, the immune system protects the host from pathogenic organisms. All the bacteria, viruses, parasites, fungi, and not only that one, but the uh, malignant cells as well. And, and it starts, as you face that, starts with skin, with mucosa, with the uh, natural protections like lysosome. And then it goes more complicated, and uh, some specialized cells get into the uh, uh, scene to deal with these old threats. The immune system has evolved uh, specialized cell types, communicating molecules, and functional response, as you see over here. Here's the virus is coming, the epithelial cell, in the uh, story of the coronavirus, it goes through the mucosa of the uh, uh, respiratory system. And here, everything starts. And there are specialized cells over here with the support of the uh, macrophage and dendritic cells. The antigen is presented to that. And the T cell when B lymphocytes answers that. T cells turns into the natural killer, kills the, uh, vir the, the cell that co contains the virus itself. And the uh, B lymphocytes evolve into plasma cells and produce the antibody. So it's an old specialized system, immune system. If you cannot stop it before entering the body, all that system starts to work and try to localize and stop the infection itself. And all those things uh, generally happens in bone marrow, spleen, and GI system, producing those cells and the training them, taming them. But in the uh, last years, we learned that uh, GI system is not only training the, the T cell or B cells, but uh, through the microbiota, it, 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 uh, it helps to, the, uh, to keep the, an effective immune system as well. And uh, you heard about that dysbiosis uh, causes the immune defective states and the, it causes many different diseases as well. So uh, all that immune system is always ready searching for the microorganism and try to stop it. And the, uh, <clears throat> during this searching, or when the infection is there, with the increased rate of the metabolism requiring energy sources, substrate for biosynthesis and the regulatory modules, they all derive from the diet. So the, to be able to keep an appropriate immune system, we need a balanced diet. As you all know much better than me, immune system and infection are together and the nutrition has an effect on that so we so the core of vitamins like A, B6, B12, folate, C, D, C, uh, vitamin C, D and E and the trace elements like zinc, copper, selenium, iron have been demonstrated to have a key role supporting the human immune system and reducing the risk of infection. And other essential, essential nutritions, some other vitamins and trace elements, and particularly amino acids and fatty acids, are also important. Among all of them, the uh, zinc and selenium has been uh, studied very well and uh, had, has been proven that they have some role supporting the antibacterial and antiv antiviral defense. So the, it seems prudent to have a uh, healthy uh, diet and it will keep us to keep our, it will help us to keep our immune system healthy as well. And again, you know, much better, we have the, uh, uh, the, the sources for those uh, vitamins and the trace elements I mentioned you, and we need to get all of them in the appropriate doses to be able to keep our immune system uh, functioning, functioning well. And again, at this point, I would like to remind one more time with the same slide, the key point to the response to a coronavirus is the number of virus. Yes, we have to uh, do our best to protect from that. But the other key element is the adequately working immune system. And it goes back to adequately or the appropriately uh, feeding system. And what is the role of those trace elements in the immune system? Where do they cross? Here, as you see, growth, development, and the differentiation of the immune cells. I mentioned you, B cells, T cells, and antigen-presenting cells. And it has been proven that vitamin A particularly has a role in the development of these T cells uh, with the vitamin B12 and the B cells as well. 
Vitamin A also enhanced the phagastric activity of the macrophages, and the vitamin also improved the natural killer cell response. I mentioned all of them uh, in the fight of immune system against the uh, coronavirus. And on the other side, I told you that if there's a cytokine overreaction, it harms body. So uh, we need some support over here too. Here you see the uh, cytokine signaling modulated by vitamin A and uh, uh, resolving inhibit cytokine storm. And the uh, vitamin D, zinc, and selenium uh, inhibits the pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine uh, support. And in that way, both helps to reduce down the inflammation. That is the, uh, the major, uh, one of the major points that, uh, that uh, harms the body. And beside that, zinc, vitamin A, and vitamin E has been proven to enhance the epithelial barrier integrity, so avoids the, uh, uh, the virus going into the, into the body. And about that, not only coronavirus, but before that, for all respiratory drug infections, there are hundreds of different studies. Uh, some of them are totally supporting, some of them are less supporting, but there are good results that those vitamins and uh, trace elements are helping, uh, helping for the protection and the healing better to the, uh, uh, to the respiratory tract infections. As you see over here, vitamin A has been studied in 47 randomized controlled trials before. We are talking about more than 1 million children. It's a huge number. And the vitamin A supp supplementation is associated with a clinical meaningful reduction in morbidity and mortality in children in the perspective of the respiratory tract infections. Another uh, 15 uh, randomized control study, more than 3,000 children, uh, helps to release, relieve clinical symptoms and signs of pneumonia and shorten the length of hospital stay. And uh, vitamin C is a little bit less prominent. Uh, I cannot defend that actually as I defend uh, vitamin A. And vitamin C suddenly became very famous during the pandemic period because there was a, uh, a big study from the United States in the intensive care patients. If you load them with vitamin C and calcium at the same time, we are talking about 40 grams a day. Uh, they, prove, they postulate that it helps to get better sooner. But unfortunately, following that paper, there were lots of crit critics and uh, it was not so clear. But uh, the point over here, if, if, if there's not, if, if, if we, we have to keep our daily need uh, in vitamin C as well too. And vitamin D, uh, Dr. Matters has talked about the uh, excessive amount of vitamin D, but you remember that uh, Spanish paper in intensive care patients again, if there is deficiency of vitamin D, and if you give, replace that, it gives uh, a better results in intensive care patients. So vitamin D was the, uh, was the most famous one actually during the pandemic period. And before that, in the uh, randomized control studies, as you see over here, uh, it has been shown he has a positive, it has a positive effect on the respiratory tract infection dosing once daily uh, uh, that has studied in that one and some more studies too. And just for curiosity, I mean, vitamin D is really talk about this morning, I have uh, just checked in the Google, not in even the scientific ones. There are lots of studies talking about the adequate level of vitamin D is a pro has a protective effect against viral infections. And the, if there's a deficiency, it must be replaced. And uh, look at that. Uh, there is more than 76,000 paper talking about only vitamin D and coronavirus. Practically, I can say that if there is so much that, that amount of study, it means it may not have very much effect. I mean, uh, I, I, we are not talking about an antibiotic. We are not talking about a uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drug. But I personally believe that with all those, those studies, those vitamins and trace elements have some effect on the uh, keeping the immune system, system alive. And this is the base for Everything this is the base for obesity. It's, it's the base for uh, long, healthy life to get the, uh, uh, the uh, balanced, uh, appropriate diet uh, every day. And zinc, uh, 
as I've told you, has a special role in the protection effect on the, um, oral, uh, the uh, epithelium cells, and it has been studied in the, in the different studies again. The, the deficiency uh, brings the immune system a little bit down, but the adequate level keeps the immune system up, especially against the upper respiratory tract infections in different studies uh, when it's given in the supplementary dose. And zinc is very famous too. It has more than 100, just would say, zinc and COVID-19. And lots of studies are still going on, and I hope they will get a result as well. So the, those are the trace elements and the nutrition, but the microbiota is uh, very alive during the uh, last five or six years. And we know that microbiota is directly related to a balanced diet as well. So it is the effect, the result of the appropriate diet. And the uh, dietary approaches to achieve a healthy microbiota can also benefit the immune system. And the microbiota has also been studied in the uh, uh, different infectious disease and including uh, coronavirus as well. As you see the uh, children and adult studies over here and the numbers are very high again. And, but there were some conflicting results, but uh, generally says a good microbiota helps immune system to keep uh, appropriate. And if there is a dysbiosis, it, it, it affects the immune system, not only immune system, but, but leaking gut, it causes the inflammation and that inflammation also needs an appropriate immune system. So if there is a dysbiosis, it must be, uh, it must be corrected as well. And uh, some more studies, I'm not going into the details, uh, but this nutrition immunity and COVID-19, it's, it's a review article in 2020, and it has been released again in 2021. I advise you for the uh, further details of the interaction between nutrition, immune system, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the microbiota and trace elements. And uh, when I say microbiota, I talk about the gut, but during the uh, last two years, as you know, we, are, we have started to talk about the pulmonary system microbiota as well, possibly in the next coming days, by changing the microbiota of the pulmonary system, we will be able to avoid the uh, respiratory tract infections too, but we are just at the beginning of the search, but there are lots of studies still going on the uh, uh, respiratory tract microbiota. And finally, I mentioned to you that uh, not only the vitamins or trace elements uh, is necessary to maintain the balance and to fight against the corona, but as a part of the uh, corona was the excess reaction of the immune system that damaged the body, what, I, what we call cytokine storm. And the, these severe infections of the respiratory cell, the epithelium, can lead to acute respiratory distress syndrome characterized by the excessive damage to host by inflammation, particularly cytokine storm. And this was the case of the severe COVID-19 patients. And there were some evidence from uh, acute respiratory distress uh, patients in other settings that cytokine storm can be controlled by uh, three fatty acids, possible through their metabolism to specialized pure resolving mediator. And I uh, could find only this study, in that particular study, the, uh, uh, the, um, it's a meta-analysis actually, effects of three fatty acids, rich formula, oops, I'm sorry, uh -oh, I lost the last one, but it was saying that it, uh, okay, thank you, uh, in some parameters, it corrects, especially the, avoids the new organ failure, but at the end, there's no direct effect on the mortality. So there is a hope, uh, uh, besides of the other classical treatment against the cytokine storm, some fatty acid rich formulas may help us in, in uh, there, there, there too. So dear colleagues, uh, uh, I try to summarize uh, those bad days that we have suffered in the last two years. Uh, <laughs> as you said, this is the first time we came out our hospitals, our home for the face-to-face -face meeting. But uh, thanks to all those uh, efforts, we could see those days. And to be able to be ready for the next coming um, outbreaks or the pandemia. Of course, we will have uh, specialized centers who will recognize the microorganism who will 
try to develop the new treatments, we will make new tools for the diagnosis, new vaccines, and how do we prevent uh, the infection? But beyond all those things, we have to keep our body ready for the infection by, uh, by keeping our um, vitamins or the trace elements amounts appropriate. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rinal. Uh, I will uh, uh, again invite Professor Erki Vertianen for a short panel discussion. So if you have any question, you can raise here. For the ones who are uh, watching our conference uh, vir virtually, uh, you can just uh, put your uh, questions in the chat box so we will collect them all. And at the end of the uh, conference on the 26th of May, we will be uh, running another roundtable session. So uh, both all the chairmen will uh, make sure that they will all the questions will be answered. So if you have any questions, we can just uh, uh, give you a microphone and you can raise your questions. Yes, Julian. Uh, can we get a microphone here? Just in the phone. Well, I'd like to start by thanking all the speakers for really inspiring presentations. And, and John, we'll hear again from you later. Um, I wanted to ask Professor Vartiainen about the healthy diet and the cost of the healthy diet. There's a perception in the UK now that um, with inflation and the recession looming, healthy diets are becoming out of reach of a large sector of the population because healthy diets are more expensive than unhealthy diets. You just briefly touched on this subject and I wondered if there's work uh, undertaken in Finland to look at healthy diets versus cost and whether this is an issue in Finland. Yeah, we have had the same, same discussion in, in Finland that then we had um, diabetes prevention program where we Professor Tuomilehto was, was running that uh, like now there's like eight year follow up where with the dietary changes and body weight changes we were able to prevent type 2 diabetes like 60 percent in the few few years and in this study we look at also the the diet very carefully and, and, the, and the food and it turned out that um, healthy diet is, is in practically no more expensive than, than unhealthy diet in, in principle. So that it's, it's, there's more like a myth. It depends what you select. If you select potatoes and carrots and, and, and so on, so they're very cheap. If you select some exotic fruits and, and expensive fish, then it's more ex expensive. But I believe that that with a with a with a normal diet you can you can have a healthy diet very very cheap. There is question of skills also, how the poor people are able to to do to select the, the healthy diet. Again, we can say that in in terms of number of calories, it's uh, easier to get uh, cheaper calories from from uh, uh, less expensive fats, so that that also may may be another point of view. But um, nowadays it's not a question of having too little calories in, in most of us. Well, thank you. That's encouraging. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, please. Thank you very much for both of the presentations. They were excellent. I just want to ask you about the, the Karela study, and it's so impressive, and congratulations on the efforts that were done and the um, impact of those. Um, in the early days when you changed from, for example, butter to the margarines, we know in that time the, the trans fatty acids in those margarines was quite high. I know that Finland has done a fantastic job you know, of getting trans fatty acids out of the food chain. 
But do you have any thoughts about the potential impact of those trans fats on risk? Yeah, I, I, in 1970s there was um, the trans, um, fat, trans fatty acids was not a big, big issue, so it was not discussed, very much discussed. When it turned out in the 1980s that uh, trans fats are uh, increasing cholesterol and decreasing HDL cholesterol, the Finnish food industry changed that very quickly. So nowadays the most of the trans fats are actually coming from milk fat in the Finnish society. So it's uh, using, using technology it, uh, totally, it's possible to, to reduce the whole, basically have no trans, trans fat fats in, 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 in margarines. Thank but, you. But I think the biggest uh, problem was really these values. So the, the butter and milk and cream and so on, cheese were highly valued and is regarded to be the best diet for them. And then the scientists came and said that this seems to be the main problem for your coronary heart disease. It was quite a shock and it, uh, it was quite, a, quite a, how to say, difficult process also in the society not only to the people, but also for the agriculture change, food industry change, uh, nutrition policy, policy change. But I guess that most of the Western countries are, are doing the same, more or less, have, having the same process nowadays. Can I ask another question? Can I just, in, in relation to, to dairy, you're right, it is, is valued in the, you know, by the public. Did, did you have a lot of lower fat dairy products rather than asking them to eliminate dairy? Was that one of the uh, strategies? So, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, so within, uh, you know, thank you for your answer, but within the, the diets, you said that the dairy is valued, and I, I, I agree with that. Was one of your strategies that you reduced the fat in the dairy, so offered low-fat yeah. dairy products rather than eliminating them from the diet? Yeah, that has been one of the strategies. So there are the food industry was really interested to develop the low-fat low fat products, and it's helping a little bit, but um, the main concern is not so much about the total fats. It's a question of the quality of fats in terms of cholesterol changes in the, in the population, so. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for both presentations, which were really uh, excellent. Um, I'd like to ask a question to um, Professor Unel um, on uh, vaccination. Um, in our country, um, there's quite a significant anti-vaccination movement um, associated with considerable misinformation that it has been quite hard for people to um, tease out and discriminate. Um, is, has that been a problem in Turkey? And if so, how have you addressed it? You just killed me. <laughs> Well, until, <clears throat> until the coronavirus uh, situation, we did not have a, a major issue in Turkey. I mean, uh, the anti-vaccine campaign, uh, we have a specialist among anti-vaccine uh, vaccine people, uh, Dr. Aksakal, is, we are working together on that. It's coming, what's coming from USA, some called some uh, uh, not trustable studies, and some professionals are forcing them and goes through the Europe and finally came to Turkey, but it was not very well accepted. Kind of the scientific way, let's say. This, this is not science, but they call it scientific. And a uh, uh, little bit supported by, by uh, religious issues, because it may contain something uh, peak insight, so that might not be appropriate. That was guaranteed at the end. Combining all those things, Together with the uh, effect of the uh, media, mainly coming from the uh, Europe and United States, there was an increase uh, in our anti-vaccinist people as well. And the, uh, it, 
did not happen as a very big issue, uh, but we have to work against that. And the uh, Minister of Health has published uh, declarations guarantee that it is safe, it is appropriate to religion, and it saves lives. And beyond that, we, could, we didn't do anything really structured thing against that. And the, uh, uh, the and the vaccination rate was not very bad actually, but it could be better. Yes, we had some problem, but it was not a very big issue, I would say. I don't know, Dr. Aksakal, would you add anything else to that? Okay, thank you very much. COVID-19 vaccine is not itself a very appropriate uh, example of vaccine hesitancy of the whole population because it was new. It was the uh, infodemic that we have realized at that specific time that we were not aware that, yes, we had anti-vaccine movements in our country as well, but as, as Dr. Unal said, it was not that much a big deal. Yes, it was increasing sharply, but still it was less than 1%, so it didn't affect the whole situation. But COVID-19 is something that people hesitated, in fact. And even the vaccine, um, not, they are not against the vaccines, they are not vaccine refusers, but they had questions because the one sat down somewhere in the world and said, I'm not trusting these Chinese people, so I don't trust the Sinovac vaccine, and then it's, it's just uh, as a bomb, you see it in the social media and it's spread it everywhere and people try to think if the Chinese vaccine is wrong, there's something wrong with it. Even if they can't specialize what is or, or verbalize what's wrong with that, but they say it's wrong, so there's something wrong. Because it's Chinese. Yeah, it's because it's Chinese. So the COVID-19 is, I think, separately should be evaluated, but still it fueled the vaccine refusers because it was a new vaccine, there were debate on it, there were a lot of information, misinformation, disinformation. So that it was discussed a lot. But there was another point that it helped us to increase the vaccine uptake in the adult population. Because for example, pneumococcal vaccine, I know it was misleading information that it would not protect against COVID-19, but still people were in queue to have pneumococcal vaccine because they believe that they will be protected. So it was a two-way uh, discussion. The refusers and hesitators were increased, but on the other hand, people started to think about and talk about vaccination, and we had some chance to yeah. talk about the vaccination to the adult population that it's needed for yourself, mm -hmm. just like the children. And I know people that they have vaccinated their elderly, their children, their risk group, but when it comes to COVID-19 vaccination, they said, wait and see. Until you die. Until you die. You come with us, dear. Yes. And on that, so you can see that. Thank you. I don't know what I need to do for this, but uh, thank you for this presentation. I want to ask actually a question in the context of obesity, which involves uh, the, the immune response. And maybe actually uh, John Matters may also comment on that. We know from previous experience that obesity has a lot of immunological problems, uh, which cuts both ways, both pro and anti. And we also know, for example, immunological interventions can go wrong in obesity. For example, the drugs against psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, neutralizing antibodies don't work very well in obesity. What is the situation with COVID-19 vaccination or infection-induced immune response among the obese? I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, that's a very important point, as you say. And before the vaccination, as you see, the uh, obese people has poorer prognosis, as it was mentioned, because the, their, um, all the uh, uh, accompanying cardiovascular or pulmonary or hypertensive, all those problems, or perhaps the immune system. I do not remember any particular study who has studied the immune response of the obese people against the vaccination. So I really cannot uh, comment on that, but as a general thing, 
and you can answer that question much better than me. And uh, uh, the obesity was, obese, obese people was uh, possibly responding less to the vaccination itself. Is it because of the immune system or uh, all the other uh, co-diseases that has been going together with the, uh, with the obesity itself? For example, di diabetes mellitus. I mean, in Turkey, as much as I know, more than 50% of the diabetic people are obese. So the, this immune less response, is it coming from obesity itself or the damage of the diabetes? I cannot differ that, but possibly there is an, uh, maybe an effect on that. I'm not sure. Thank you. Dr. Satman from Istanbul University. Uh, I'm just talking about diabetes and obesity in COVID. And we had the chance to evaluate the in, in, during the first wave of uh, pandemic in Turkey. We have evaluated more than four, uh, uh, I think 400,000 people with uh, COVID. And we searched it, whether, uh, I mean, diabetes or uh, obesity, or uh, if they are independent, I mean, eff uh, effects uh, on uh, COVID. And we reached to the conclusion that uh, diabetes itself has an independent effect, and obesity, if added on uh, diabetes, it will increase the uh, prognosis in terms of morbidity and mortality, and so on. Okay. Question: The immune response. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really uh, do partly. Not uh, yeah, no. uh, as we used uh, only the Minister of Health uh, data, we had partly immune uh, predictors and parameters. Yeah. So actually, we are on time. I'm checking the time, by the way. Uh, so we will be going to a coffee break, uh, but we have to be sharp and follow the schedule because we have to start at 12:45 uh, because we need to consider about our virtual uh, participants as well. So en enjoy your break and hope to see you in half an hour. So welcome back again. Uh, we are starting the session two, the nutritional status of the UK and Turkish populations. So uh, I will be inviting our uh, first speaker and the chair of this uh, session as well. Professor Alison Tetstone uh, will be presenting the nutritional status of the UK population overview, overview of the key issues and examples of initiatives to address them. Dr. Alison Tetstone retired from the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities uh, in March. Uh, there she was the chief nutritionist and led the nutrition programs including the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, scientific advice uh, programs including the National Diet and Nut Nutritional Survey, scientific advice uh, and promote physical activity. So uh, please let me uh, welcome Professor Alison Tetstone uh, to make her speech. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm not a professor. <laughs> I just heard that. that. Um, uh, so so um, I'm going to give a quick overview of the data we have on the nutrition status of the UK population. And then I'm going to move on to talk about um, initiatives that have been underway for years in the UK to try and combat um, the nation's uh, poor diet. Um, and then do a bit of a spotlight on sugar and a bit of a spotlight on, on what next. So um, John Mathers showed this slide. This is what the nation should be doing in terms of what we should be eating, no different from um, everywhere else in the world. Um, and um, of course, um, we have a, uh, we, the nation is not doing it. Um, um, and um, pretty well every nutritionist from everywhere around the world could stand up and, and say that. Um, in the UK, we know that very well. We've had... Um, probably 30 years of national surveillance of nutrition in the country. We have something called the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, which now um, uh, assesses the population on a continual basis and does detailed nutritional assessment um, of, of the population in terms of, its, in terms of our food intake, our heights and weights, 
um, and um, uh, our nutrition status, so blood samples and nurse measurements are taken. Um, the survey is published, so you can read all about it on the, on the government's website. So these are data from the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, and what we see is that, um, is that, um, the, uh, that fat intake is broadly in line with recommendations. Um, the good news is that trans fatty acid intake is very low in the UK. We've largely had that eliminated from our food chain. Um, and saturated fat intake exceeds recommendations. Um, uh, free sugar intake um, uh, is, um, is above recommendations at around 12%, and we have some groups, particularly, particularly adolescents, with really very high intakes of sugar. Fibre intakes are below recommendations, and salt intakes have come down considerably over the years, which I'll talk about more about that in a minute, but they are out of kilter with recommendations. They're too high, um, and fruit and vegetable intake are below recommendations. I'm not going to present data um, according to socioeconomic status, but broadly speaking, every um, age group and population segment in the UK has, diet, has a diet that is not aligned with recommendations. Poor people living on low income tend to have worse diets in many respects, but um, poor diet is not just a problem of poverty in the UK, as I expect it is in most countries. It's a problem across, across all age and population groups. So in terms of trend, we have of fortification, um, of voluntary fortification of some foods. And um, we have seen a reduction in iron intakes. At least part of that is due to a reduction in red meat consumption. Um, so, um, and this, this is the foods. Um, so that was the nutrients and this is the foods. And we've got um, some, we've seen no changes in fruit and veg despite just about everybody in the population knowing they should eat more fruit and veg. Um, uh, we've seen reductions in um, sugar-sweetened drinks, um, and um, that's, that's good, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. No real changes in confectionery, and these are just some example foods. Um, now, in all, in all national survey, in the nutrition surveys across the world, we have under-reporting. So that means that we can't assess the absolute quantity um, of um, nutrients being consumed, and that in, in, includes energy. So we calculate energy using standard equations and the height and weight of the population that we get from the Health Survey for England. And these are calculations that Public Health England did, my team did, in 2018. And these show that how, how common excess energy intake is in the population. So for adults, we can see, seeing on average adults consuming two to 300 calories more than they require a day uh, for a healthy body weight. And that is why we have an obesity problem. We, and that is the level, that's the level of en energy intake that excess that you cannot possibly exercise off. I'm not going to talk about physical activity at all in this talk, but obesity solutions that are based on telling the population to exercise more are misplaced because of the level of energy excess. Randomized controlled trials show that you cannot increase energy expenditure by that level in a population. Um, so those are the data for adults in red. The data for children are in pink, uh, um, are in blue. And as I said, these were calculated in 2018. Since then, we've had an upturn in childhood obesity rates, so we know excess energy consumption by children is more than this. 
um, and we haven't yet published data on what those figures are. Um, I should have just calculated, actually, and told you what it was today, so I regret doing that. But we see for children that are overweight, really quite high levels of excess, of excess energy consumption. Again, way beyond what you could exercise off. And these, so moving on to um, some anthropometry, this, we measure the population quite frequently um, in the UK. These are measured obesity rates, so um, they're not dependent on self-reporting. Um, and we have um, over 25% uh, 20, over, um, of the population who are living with obesity. And that's why, as John pointed out, it should be no surprise in the UK as in many countries, that we had an over-representation of those living with obesity in our ICU units during the pandemic. Rather oddly, it was a surprise, though, as John, as John pointed out, to, me, to many politicians, despite um, the clear data that um, obesity increases the risk of a range of diseases. I think that's because um, type 2 diabetes is insidious. It happens over many years, whereas COVID-19 was really in politicians' faces, not least because our Prime Minister ended up in ICU because of it. Um, so these are the data for children. We measure just about every child um, in primary school at the beginning and end of primary school in England. That's four to five-year-olds and 10 to 11-year-olds. So this is about a million children every year that get measured in the National Child Measurement Programme. And we have seen, we have seen if you look at the upturn at the, um, on the far side of the graph, during the pandemic, we saw very scary increases in the level of childhood obesity. We, I haven't included data here on what happened to food purchases during the pandemic, but we saw very large increases in calorie sales out of retail and from the out-of-home out of industry. Um, and um, I've noticed that in this conference so far, we've been talking about a lot about food choice of individuals. We have to remember that food choices of individuals are highly manipulated by our food environments. Um, and uh, sometimes I think, I think it's quite hard to remind um, people of that. Um, so um, for children, patterns of obesity vary greatly according to socioeconomic status. These are data for, that compare children living in the most deprived areas from the least deprived areas. And you can see that for the 45-year-olds and, um, and the 10 to 11-year-olds, risk of living with obesity is double if double that for the most deprived children compared with the least deprived children. But I think it's important that people recognize so that the least deprived are also carrying a high burden of obesity. Like poor diet, obesity isn't solely a problem of, of income. Um, it's a problem of living in a modern society. Um, so over the years, we've had um, a lot of nutrition initiatives in the UK, actually, and a lot of them have been implemented pretty well. We've had pretty good implementation of them, and we have things that are done by legislation and things that are done voluntarily. So we have school food standards. They're implemented pretty well in our primary schools for the younger children, pretty badly in our secondary schools, but we've had school food standards for a long time. We've ha we have free school meals for um, young children, children aged four to five. We have free um, vitamins, milk, um, and uh, fruit and veg for um, uh, parents of children under five living on low income, so we have welfare support. Um, we've had an advertising ban that, um, on, ch on children's television programs since 2000, 2007. And we've got standards for um, government standards for the procurement of food provided in the NHS and in government buildings. We've had voluntary initiatives. Um, so we've, um, we, we've worked with our food industry and some of that has been very successful. We've seen an 11% reduction in uh, salt intake and we've seen, um, a, uh, we've seen the removal of trans fatty acid. And we've got a voluntary front of pack labeling scheme um, and um, that's had actually quite high uptake. I'm not going to talk about that today, but it tends to be biased towards the healthier foods, though. Um, so um, 
We have also, in more recent years, seen some more, seen um, the introduction of soft, uh, soft uh, sugary drinks um, tax, um, the uh, soft drinks industry levy, which I'll talk more about in a moment. Um, and we've seen a change towards a more structured approach of working with the food industry, still voluntary, but more structured. And um, I'm going to talk about that more in a moment in terms of sugar. And we've had treatment services come online. You'll hear Professor Lean talking about that later in terms of the diabetes prevention program um, and indeed more weight management services. During all this time um, in the UK, we have spent a lot of money um, in terms of marketing to the public on what constitutes a healthy diet. I can tell you for the um, um, it's been throughout my 20 year civil service career, every year we've campaigned. Um, and that has probably had some effect. For example, the reduction in sugary drinks consumption probably uh, uh, relates to the taxation, but also to marketing. Um, and um, this is just examples, but every year we're spend, we spend a considerable amount of money on, on TV advertising. We have online presence all the time. And, and direct marketing into schools. And most people can tell you what a healthy diet should be. They may not get, it, get the details of it right, but they do know the general points. So I promised you a bit of spotlight on sugar, so just talk about that. So um, we have an independent advisory committee process in the UK, the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition. Uh, Professor Lugrove will talk about this in more detail uh, later at the meeting. But in 2015, our Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition published a report on carbohydrates and health. This had, been, had a lot of media attention because there was worries about bias within the committee. There was worries that the committee wouldn't draw, draw um, um, firm conclusions. On the other hand, the food industry was saying it was going to be a load of rubbish. It would be far too strong. And finally, the report was published in 2015. And in it, they um, described the data on the relationship between sugar intake and health risk. Um, and, that in, and drew conclusions on um, high levels of sugar consumption and tooth decay, which we all had known for many years, high levels of sugar in the diet and greater risk of higher energy intake. Sacken weren't able to describe the mechanism, but I suppose it's something about pal palatability that drives, um, it's just nice to eat sweetened food, so you tend to eat more of them. They, they um, um, describe the particular data, the randomized control trials that show a relationship between uh, sugary drinks intake and risk of um, increased BMI, um, and the relationship between sugar, sugar um, drinks and risk of type 2 diabetes. And because of that, they recommend, they pushed um, advice to uh, reduce sugar intakes. And because of the description of the relationship between excess energy consumption, this provided a platform for government to do more work. Um, and very importantly, they said that sugary drink intake should be minimized. And the then public health minister went further and said sugary drinks have no place in, in a child's diet. So at the same time, Public Health England, which is where nutrition was based at the time um, in government, we, we said, well, it's all very well and good having these recommendations, but how are you going to achieve them? Just putting the recommendations on the government website, telling a few, few health professionals about it is not going to change anything. So we reviewed the evidence um, on what could change, thing, change things. We looked at the effect of really structural drivers of what we buy and consume, price promotions within our supermarkets, um, advertising, um, the reformulation programs, how they were working at the time, effects of taxation and so on. And the key points in this is that Public Health England said to government, if you want to do something about this, you need to go beyond food labels and nutrition education. 
Those are very important things, but they're not going to improve the population start so overall. You need to be doing structural things. The impact on the volume of what, 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 is, being per, what is being offered and purchased. We commented that today's food environment, where we live, is so different than it was in the 1970s. I was listening to the, thinking about the North Karelia example. Oh my gosh, things have changed so much since then. When I was a child, there were a few food outlets on a high street. Now there's every shop just about is a food outlet. It's very hard to resist all those things. So Public Health England said, you need to do several things, and you need to do it really deeply. We recommend that you can, that you're putting effect controls on price promotions. You limit more the advertising of um, on healthy foods. You you change the reformulation program so they're much more structured and businesses are much more accountable. And you and you combine that um, combine that with taxation. And that's because. Our intentions to eat healthily are undermined in our, by our food environments. It's really, really tempting if something is on, on that checkout at a supermarket to pick it up and put it in your shopping basket. It's really tempting when things are on special offer to buy them. And you don't feed them to your hamster, you eat them, and that leads, to, and that over time in, increases your weight. Um, and government was pretty galvanised about this, and um, then in 2016 we introduced um, a levy on um, soft drinks, which was dependent on the sugar within those products, and a structured reformulation programme was introduced for sugar. Um, in 2018, um, the government promised advertising, advertising restrictions and promotional restrictions, and I'll come on to those towards the end of the presentation. So, um, from 2016, Public Health England set about running, with food, um, set about running a new reformulation programme on sugar. For that, industry was... Uh, with, through consultation, guidelines were set for sugar reduction for the top contributing foods to sugar reduction. Companies were asked to reduce sugar by 20%, um, and Public Health England monitored what was, what was going on. And if you look at the reports that have been published on this, you can, see what you can see what's gone on across food categories, and you can also see what individual businesses are doing. So if you look at breakfast cereals, you can see how well Kellogg's have done, and you can see how well Nestle have done. And the answer is very wibbly. Um, so these are the most recent data we've published. New data hopefully will be published soon. But overall, we can see that the program has um, had very mixed results. 3%, there's been an overall reduction from retail and manufacturer products of 3% of sugar. By this stage in the program, we would have hoped to see 15%, so there's been a big undershoot. But if you look at the detail, you can see really good progress by some sectors. So breakfast cereals, really good, 13% reduction. Yogurt's really good, 13% reduction. Some good progress for um, ice creams, um, um, and uh, spreads and cakes, but uh, no change or increases for high sugar products, that's breakfast, um, biscuits and confectionery. Now, people would say back to me, it's really hard to reformulate those products, but you, and that is true, maybe not for biscuits, you certainly can reformulate biscuits, and we certainly have good examples of companies doing that. But companies did say that they would take some sugar, one big company did say it would take sugar out of its products, and the answer is it hasn't done it. And I would argue that a lot of that is to do with commercial incentives to sell more. Oh, and I forgot to talk, I need to go back. Oh, I don't know how to go back. Oh, that's how you go back. I forgot to mention the soft drinks industry level, levy. That has been super successful. We have seen a 40, basically a 44% reduction in the amount of sugar in, um, coming out of soft drinks as a category. That's amazing. Uh, that's one of the biggest reductions that anybody has seen around the world. Taxation works. That's the bottom line. These, this, the levy is structured so it's on businesses. Businesses have been highly 
highly incentivised to take sugar out of their products. And it's benefited all socioeconomic classes. This is data on sugar reduction from soft drinks across different socioeconomic groups, broadly the same effect across all socioeconomic groups. That's so unusual on a nutrition initiative. You always see more effect on the uh, more benefit of the on the higher socioeconomic group, groups. Structured approaches benefit all. Um, and I realise I'm running a bit out of time. We've also had supportive policies. Um, so, we've, so we've had school food standards and um, marketing and so on that have been supporting the reformulation program. But overall, when you look at the net effect, we have seen no real change in the amount of sugar going into shopping baskets. And that's because the effect of removing sugar from breakfast cereals, yogurts and drinks has been counteracted by the confectionery industry selling much more confectionery. I would argue that that is not because the UK population has suddenly got a great passion for confectionery. I would argue that it's been driven by businesses highly promoting and advertising confectionery. Um, and there is a lesson here for other countries, um, which I hope you will learn. Now, uh, three weeks ago, um, uh, the, uh, the government announced that it, put on, it has put on hold um, controls on price promotion and advertising of unhealthy foods. Jamie Oliver led a protest out, outside, who's one of our advocates, led a protest outside number 10 on this. And this is part of the reason why the sugar reduction program has only been partially successful. Because if you remember back on the slide I had right at, towards the beginning of this, Public Health England said you needed to do a lot of things and you needed to do them all at the same time. The reformulation program has been running since 2015-16. We still don't have price promotion controls, so your um, population is still being highly influenced by advertising of these foods. Um, and I won't talk about the details of those, but they were due. To, um, the advertising, the price promotion controls were due to come in at the end of the year. Um, um, in stores and online, and the advertising controls were due to come in um, in 2024. So still quite a long way off, even if we get a go the go-ahead for them now. So the whole issue is that our food environment is unhealthy, and this kind of illustrates it. The C these are data from the um, Access to Nutrition in Index, which looks at what is being sold um, by our by global businesses. And global businesses are producing food that is overwhelmingly unhealthy. The major so most businesses, when you meet them, will say, well, we do have healthy options, and they do. But the majority of food, the average food, is unhealthy. And this is only judged against the Australian Health Star System, which is a pretty lax measure of healthfulness. We've also had a massive, right, we've got massive disruption of the food chain going on at the moment because of the rise in delivery. There has been over a 200% increase in food delivery in the UK. Foods purchased from, the, on, um, from, far, from fast food businesses tend to be double the calories of those that you buy in retail. Um, so that is another driver towards obesity that is really coming on stream very quickly. We've also had, um, with the economic crisis that's going on, the Ukrainian war and so on, we're s certainly in the UK, we're seeing big increases in food poverty. We're seeing more people than ever before using food banks and using food aid. Um, and that will inevitably um, increase um, calorie intake because the poorer you are, the more likely you are to be responding to all those special offers be responding to those delivery things that come into your phone on a Friday evening say, saying, how about a pizza? Here's, t here's five pounds off it. So in order to turn the tide on the nation start, you need structural approaches. And a report came out last year from, um, on the National Food Strategy that was um, presented by Henry Dimbleby. 
um, that talks about the need to redesign our food system so we escape the thing he called the junk food, food cycle, which is economically driven. Our food businesses need to do well, they need to build their, their share value, and they do that by selling more. And until we break out of that economic cycle that incentivizes us all to buy and eat more, we're not going to improve our diets, and this is true around the world. So, to close, just a few summary points for me. UK diets are completely out of kilter with recommendations, as I expect they are everywhere around the world. Current po policies have had some, but not enough impact. Um, food environments are very unhealthy. Um, expanding, through, expanding food sales, um, which we've seen greatly during the pandemic um, and will only continue, is driven by um, economics of food businesses and, and, very importantly, the expansion of delivery of fast food. We need to go beyond nutrition education and intervention um, and education if we want to combat this. That means thinking of the commercial realities of what is going on for food businesses. And we need deep, sustained structural intervention if we're going to do, to do this. And all of that requires a high degree of political commitment which, um, in my experience, comes and goes. Our Prime Minister recognised that his diet led him into an ICU unit because of the effect it had on it, his weight. It didn't stop our government from, from putting on hold uh, the two major interventions that could have effect, improved the diet of our nation. Because, as John says, um, um, pe pe despite the recognition that obesity affects the nation's health very starkly during COVID. Um, uh, it, it didn't take long to forget that. I'm trying to think of the best way to say it. Anyway, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Lilson. Um, uh, so we are still in the uh, session two, the nutritional status of the UK and Turkish populations. So uh, with my great pleasure, I will be inviting our second speaker of the session, Professor Halit Tanju Beslar, and he will be speaking on the nutritional status of the Turkish population, and he will give overview of the key issues and examples of the initiatives to address them. So uh, I will uh, spend a few words about him. Uh, he is uh, in right now Istanbul Kent University. He is the head of nutrition and dietetics department. Dr. Halit Tanju Beslar completed his undergraduate study in the nutrition and dietetics department at Hacettepe University in 1986, and he graduated from a uh, nutrition and dietetics program in Health Sciences Institute at Hacettepe University as well. He commenced uh, at Department of Human Nutrition and Medical Faculty of Southampton University in 1995. His areas of expertise are including nutrition and dietetics and nutrition and nutritional biochemistry. He has published more than 60 papers in the reputed journals, and he has board memberships and consultancies in many public and non-public institutions, in particular, Ministry of Health and Ministry of Food, Agriculture, and Animal Husbandry, in the matters of nutrition, food, and healthcare areas. So please, uh, let me uh, invite Professor Halit Tanju Beslar, but I think we will need a, a, a moment uh, because his uh, computer will be uh, plugged in. So uh, he preferred to speak in Turkish, uh, and I, I uh, guess you ha all have your headphones. For the virtual, virtual participants, uh, you can uh, just uh, try the uh, language uh, preference for following in your native language. Thank you very much. Welcome, Tanju Hocam. Everything is on screen. Okay. 
Thanks a lot. And then zaten söyledin Yes, you have already mentioned I'll be speaking in Turkish. I'll be talking about the nutritional status of the Turkish population and I'll be talking about some health issues with respect to Turkish population and of course it's going to be about nutrition and you can see it is the title of my speech the nutritional status of the Turkish population overview of the key issues and examples of initiatives to address them Yes, all of us, actually, we know that. We know the importance of adequate and healthy nutrition. There are five nutrition groups, and I don't believe that there is need for touching upon them, but I'd like to touch upon four of those five main nutrition fields. Maybe we can just touch upon them meat and meat products milk and dairy products and bread and bread alternatives and fruit and vegetables and also there is this fifth group among the basic fundamental nutrition groups but uh, we don't want to mention it very much like fat and sugar uh, so this is the group that we don't want to mention. There is no need for talking about them. So all this data on the slide is from the Ministry of Health. I just want to underline this, really, because I haven't added anything on top of this data. I don't want to give any additional data. This is the official data of the Ministry of Health. Like Begum has mentioned, as Hacettepe University, we exerted great effort for the preparation of these documents. So I'm just going to mention the fifth part of these groups. Adequate and balanced nutrition is quite important, as we all of know. especially in recent years in Turkey, and I'll be mentioning it later on, non-communicable diseases and nutrition-related diseases have become very important and they have increased in recent years, especially in Turkey, and I will only mention them. In 2022, approximately two months ago, World Health Organization published a report. Actually, Turkish uh, report comes from 2016, but uh, here you can see the abstract of the World Health Organization report abstracts. Especially when it comes to non-communicable diseases, it is related to overweight and obesity situation. So, overweight and obesity affect almost 60% of adults and nearly one in three children. And in the press uh, bulletin, we can also see this very fact. When it comes to non-communicable diseases, nutrition has huge importance and uh, immobile life a life without any movement. This is really crucial in terms of the NCDs. Unfortunately, overweight and obesity in today's world is increasing tremendously. Yes, we are very happy. Uh, we are approximately 100 people. We think that 
I believe we all agree because of COVID-19, we were not together in the past, but right now we are happy because we are able to come together right now. We know that COVID-19 effects can be very much related to world uh, BMI effects as well. So when it comes to the burden of non-communicable diseases, we can see five main factors like the tobacco use, physical inactivity, alcohol consumption and unhealthy diet, especially the youngsters between the ages of 15 to 17 years, they approximately are in their houses for six hours. They spend their times just watching some things on the screens or doing some things in front of the screens. So this is a very basic problem. And actually, unhealthy diet is very crucial for non-communicable diseases increase. Prior to me, Dr. Allison has been given some information with respect to the UK. But when we have a look at this chart, by the way, this chart is not my data. This is from the World Health Organization. Unfortunately, in Turkey, just the opposite of the world, in women, uh, there is higher obesity in our country, as opposed to the other countries in the world. Here, 60% goes for men and 70% for women. So, but in average, 65% is the obesity rate in Turkey. So, we are ranked in the first place in Europe in terms of obesity. As you can see, Malta, Israel, and other countries are following us. UK. Yes, it goes on like this. It's very interesting that when you have a look at this chart, you make certain comments like Italy and Spain. These two countries are used to be at a different ranking on this chart, but this is 2022 data. Here, Spain is not at the very lower place like it used to be. Here it is on the ninth place, as you can see. And Italy is also following afterwards. So there is no Mediterranean diet. I can see and I can say this very clearly. Obesity and body weight control has been deteriorated and distorted in each and every country. It is very much obvious that it is not easy to control body mass and body weight. When we have a look at the comorbidities related to body weight, we know this very clearly. There are many systematic effects like rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes and also many other diseases are related to the dysfunction on the body weight control. Just solely by looking at this chart, we can understand that if we can control body weight in all the countries, it would create a huge difference. This is really important. So, this is again the BMI chart of the World Health Organization. According to the BMI, there are certain classifications. Here you can see, for instance, maybe this part. Well, of course, for children, it is not correct to say this per se, but for children, there are certain things to mention. Again, control of body weight and BMI and Z score should be separated. So, but this is a normal range, 18.50 to 24.99 kilogram per square meter is normal weight. But I'll mention another thing. Maybe I need to just say this immediately. I'm sure you will also agree, some of you at least. Morbid obese in Turkey. 
people with 35 BMI or over 35. I can see Ilhan, Professor Ilhan, because Ilhan carried out two DEP trials, even though these trials are related to adults. Approximately, we can see 5% is the amount of morbid obese of the adult population. Yes, there is 5% of morbid obese adults in Turkey. Actually, this is not very different from other countries in the world. Like uh, people having higher BMI value over 35, and people who are going under bariatric surgery, is about 5%. And I don't know whether they should be undergoing bariatric surgery or not. This is another discussion. Another important thing, another important concept is again from the World Health Organization. And all around the world, we use these concepts, uh, waist circumference in men. It should be less than 94 if it is over 94 centimeters and if it is over 80 centimeters in women, then we can say that there is health risks in those individuals. And then we have a look at the waist and height ratio. Again, this is something, an important classification for us uh, from the World Health Organization, uh, from the Ministry of Health. Uh, this is the chart that I've taken from our ministry. If it is less than 0.4, there's no problem, but we should be cautious. But if it is in between 0.4 and 0.5, it is normal. But if it is above that level, again, we have to be much more careful. Okay. There are very basic issues uh, we are confronting as of this moment. How can we control our body weight? What is the mechanism? What is the biological mechanism? Gökhan Otomushlagil is there for many years, approximately for 25 years. He has been dealing with this job. Gökhan, is there a magic formulation? Is there a magic thing? Uh, but it's not possible to hear him. But he says no. Uh, he says no, there is no magic stick for this problem. I wish that we had this magic stick, then we uh, could solve uh, the obesity and overweight problem, which is approximately 65% in our total population, including men and women. And we have Professor Matters here. And Professor Matters, if um, Professor wants to say something about UK, is there any magic stick solution? Julie Gross is here. So, so all of us share this same problem. There is no magic. There was a paper in 1995, uh, which is in Nature, is the leptin one, and then it's called as a miracle hormone. So, 1995, Gökhan, leptin, there is no answer. So, leptin is very important uh, hormones, but, you know, there is no miracle one. So, this is the, uh, özür dilerim. Okay, switching back to Turkish. This is really crucial, and you can add many comments on this. There are factors about energy intake and energy expenditure. He's speaking in English. He's asking whether there's an input. Slides. Okay. So. Physical activity is very important. Physical activity is very important. Physical activity is really crucial. Really, really crucial. I've mentioned it before and in children. I mean, this is the situation in Turkey. 11 to 17 years of age. Six hours of 
lack of physical activity. They are in front of the screens just for six hours. So uh, if they sleep eight hours, so we can understand that there is a huge problem for us. Very recently, uh, we know that stress factor has become much more important in the body weight. Adipose tissue um, has is very crucial. How do we define obesity? There is lower level of inflammatory, uh, inflammatory response. Cytokines are there, all of them. And for the inflammatory response, all the parameters are current there. So should we get anti-inflammatory? What happens? This is another question. We can't solve the problem. Each and every day, the situation is getting worse and worse. And especially in Turkey. But it is not specific or peculiar to Turkey. This is a global problem. There are some cultural movements and activities. Naturally, they increase energy intake and psychological state is also very effective. When I get excited or stressed, let's say I have a fight with my husband, I have a fight with my children, I'm just in, in front of the refrigerator and I start eating. Energy intake is 600, 700 calories and then it boomed, it exploded. So, here, another problem that we can't solve. Yes, there is something, um, I don't know how to say, something important. Then I ate it, then it stopped, and then there is nothing that we can solve this kind of cultural, psychological, state-related issues. And economic condition, eating habits. I'm sure that whole world, as of this moment, is having huge troubles about COVID and COVID-related conditions. But these are economic conditions. It's valid for all countries in the world. It's not about only Turkey, but we have to say this, unfortunately. I'd like to underline this. Unfortunately, in Turkey, the state has not invested on the solution of this problem. And in the US, approximately once in three months, source is allocated for the society. I mean, for two years we were in our houses, but not enough help or aid was given to the society. This is about politics, and I don't want to dwell on this topics, but as we all know, that socio-economic level is very much affecting the nutrition of the societies, and it has a direct effect, actually. We don't have any doubt about this. And in Turkey, if the socio-economic level is low, I can say this very clearly, Overweight and obesity ratio is higher in Turkey. There is a stunted concept, and I can again say this very bluntly and clearly, and this is again from the Ministry of Health, there is 3%. Due to malnutrition or undernutrition, there is 3% of population, and in the lower economic and social economic level regions, uh, this ratio is higher in Turkey and in other countries as well. When you have a look at the regional differences, you can also see 9.9% malnutrition and also stunted condition. So there is no need to hide this. It is related to direct malnutrition. So what shall we do? What kind of a solution is needed? We can discuss this later on, separately. Well, Yeah.
This is again from the Ministry of Health website. 2010, Turkey Nutrition and Diet Habits Research. And there is also the 2017 version of this. And I was one of the research coordinators of 2010. So this is according to the NUTS, non nomenclature of the territorial units for statistics. So there was this 60 to 70 percent of the World Health Organization. And you can see this range in Turkey, but there is huge differences according to the regions, socioeconomic level and also body weight. Here you can see there is an opposite correlation, unfortunately. It was not in my plan, by the way. I wasn't planning this, but I want to ask this question to Professor Mathers. Wasting bread on a daily basis, how much bread is uh, going waste in the UK on a daily basis. 200 grams or 250 grams? You don't have any idea. You don't have any clue, Julia? No? Alison? Quite a lot. Begin? Five? No. Five? Five. Bread in Turkey. So, uh, it's 250 grams per bread. So you can, Julian, you can, you know, calculate it. So 5.5 million, million bread. So every bread 250 grams, just calculate it. Huge. Dolayısıyla well, therefore, and we are talking about million. hunger, uh, 900 million people, 1.4 million obese people, and overweight and obese people and on the other edge 800 850 million people are suffering from hunger and in Turkey 5.5 million loaf of bread yes a worth of 250 grams are wasted on a daily basis this is Turkish data this is from the Federation of Turkish Food and Beverages Association. Yes, there is malnutrition, obese, overweight, hidden hunger, and also vitamin deficiencies, vitamin mineral deficiencies. 5.5 million loaves of bread. If we can just stop wasting them, about niacin, about vitamin B, about riboflavin, we won't see problems in Turkey. I don't believe that it's going to be a problem in Turkey if we can just stop wasting bread. So we have, all of us have responsibilities. Okay, let's talk about the physical inactivity in Turkey, because I'm talking about Turkey. Actually, on one sense, I'm talking about the world, but of course, I'm just talking for Turkish status. Gökhan is not here. He just left, but I don't know why he left. Okay. In the old population and in women and uh, men, there is a very severe physical activity lacking. But I think it's two to three years of data. 
uh, the Ministry of Health's data is of two to three years. COVID also affected the physical inactivity, yes, lack of activity, inactive lifestyle, especially five to six hours of screen time for kids are associated to many diseases. It's actually calling for many non-communicable uh, diseases. So, esteemed professor in the UK, obesity and diabetes, you were talking, can you please say something about the ratio of diabetes and obesity in the UK? I know John Matters, uh, like when I was writing my dissertation thesis, so he was in the Newcastle, there were nutrition society meetings, so I was all uh, watching him on the uh, society's meetings, that's why I, I would like to ask a question. So what is the diabetes ratio in the UK? I think I'll ask my two answers. 60% of the 60% yeah. 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 60 well, Professor Ilhan is the pioneer of this issue, and he says 15. So 15 out of 100 adults, especially in adults, yes. 15 out of 100 adults have diabetes. So here, let's say we have 100 people in this room. Approximately 15 people have diabetes or glycemic index related problems in Turkey. And B12, folic acid, and vitamin D, vitamin D, okay. The UK is very lucky, why? Why, Professor Ilhan, why is the UK lucky in terms of vitamin D? Because it's the country of sun. No, it actually compared to them, we uh, uh, have much more sun exposure. But I think it's about the approach of the people in the UK. My daughter lives in the UK, but even in the cold weather, people are outside, so they grab a sandwich, they just are in the parks, but we are in much more closed places. So yes, we work in closed spaces and closed areas, but this is the most important thing. And while we were talking among ourselves, we say that milk and dairy products are a great source of vitamin D. This is totally wrong in terms of dietitian uh, science, dietary science. Dairy is not a source for vitamin D, but in the UK, it is vitamin D added products is in front of your door. So it is vitamin D enhanced milk that you drink, especially. Okay. Peki, değiştirdim. Doktor, doktor. Okay, then I'll just switch. Uh, Dr. Allison corrected me. When you go to uh, the supermarkets, like in Sainsbury or Asda, you can find some milk oh, that is enhanced uh, with vitamin D, but we don't have it in Turkey. So, if in the UK, Julian, maybe, maybe the state, the government, can set up a rule about the enhancement of milk with the vitamin D, but it's open to discussion. But in Turkey, unfortunately, Professor Matters, 90%, 90% yes, are um, suffering of vitamin D deficiency in Turkey, but the sun is just up on the sky. 
there is too much sunlight exposure of our country, but we can't get use of this. But what is the rationale behind this? What is the reason behind that? Because we have this sunlight, there is this UV, 390, 425 nanometer light is coming. Okay, I guess I have only a minute. So, if I'm to wrap it up all the problems in Turkey in a minute, because I was given my last one minute, at the very basic point of malnutrition or undernutrition in Turkey, there comes the lack of protein, especially for younger age children. Bioavailability is a crucial problem. Yes, it's a very crucial problem. And no matter what, we have this animal source protein and um, plant-based protein. Dr. Elson is asking to you whether you want to sit down or not. Especially in children, protein is very important. We have to emphasize that. And vitamin D is another problem. In each five women at the age of productive uh, term, uh, productive period, is suffering from anemia. Um, iron deficiency anemia in the reproductive age women and milk and dairy products if we can consume them that wouldn't be a problem but in Turkey unfortunately again this is another data it used to be 3.5 TL the um, liter. One liter of milk used to be 3.5 TL, but currently this is 7 TL. And the processed milk. The price of the UHD milk in UK, Julia? Any, any clue? So just give me, just, you know, not to see. One pound. One pound. So one pound uh, makes, what do you One pound corresponds to 20 Turkish lira. So milk and dairy products consumption is very low in Turkey. Calcium intake is again another problem. And in the older ages, some uh, skeletal problems are very much related to calcium and vitamin D and phosphor, calcium phosphor rate. Um, so what is the their products amount use uh, consumption in Turkey in adults 0.2 percent milk and dairy products altogether point two so uh, pick uh, okay without further ado I don't want to make Alison stand up again and I'd like to thank you so much for your patience and on the discussion panel we'll have many more things to discuss thank you thank you very much so you're very welcome yeah I will we, we I will. have questions yeah sure um so does anybody have questions There is one, one gentleman, he is professor of food engineer, Mehmet Polar. 
Uh, I'm sure not he has a, he has a questions. Julian, I, Julian. Yeah, okay, I'd like Julian. to um, firstly highlight the work that Alison Tedstone has done over more than 20 years in terms of nutrition in the UK. There's been a really excellent focus. The Eat Well plate was developed and there have been a number of initiatives including the salt reduction which apparently salt has been reduction. successful, the sugar reduction which is less successful but has shown a reduction in sugar intake. In terms of the impact on the population and on children, how will you judge the success of these initiatives in the longer term? Oops. Well, I think, thank you, Julian. Well, I think um, um, longer term, we need, adapt, we need to change the tide on the obesity problem, don't we? That's the critical thing, is bringing down calorie intakes um, and rebalancing the diet towards healthy options, um, um, towards healthier choices, which we can only achieve by changing our food environment. Um, and I think Henry Dimbleby in his report said it very well, we need to break the junk food cycle, but it will come down to the body weights. That's, that's yes. the critical thing, and uh, we're a long way from achieving improvement in that. Yes. And for Professor Bessler, um, I think we're all intrigued to know. Julian. Sakin ol. Julian, I'm sorry. Sen bilirsin. Okay, you, you just. What was actually the salt consumption in Turkey? Salt consumption, okay? So if you go back to 10 years ago in Turkey, it's almost. 18.5 grams. My gosh, my gosh. Yes, 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 yes. 18.5 grams. Now, 11. So, still, the good progress. we need to have a, you know, the progress. 11 grams. What about the, uh, one of the, your question is, uh, to Alison, sugar consumption. So what about sh sugar consumption in Turkey, uh, in UK? Uh, well, sugar consumption is way more than recommendations. Um, and Eight, 15? No, no, no. no, no. no. It, it's, it's, about, it's about 12. 12. So the all the calories. 12% of energy. To, uh, so we are lucky, we are at about 6% to 7%. Consumption, but it's increasing. Um, Professor Lean. Yes. Alison, I wonder if you can take this opportunity to, to look with your vision of the future. How might governments use fiscal powers to combat obesity? Are we talking about product reformulation, about portion size control, about limitation of availability? What is seriously possible now? Through fiscal intervention? Yeah. Um, well, um, um, we, I mean, we have seen throughout the world um, anywhere where fiscal levers have been applied that they have been successful. Um, in the products that have been taxed, but they have really been applied in a quite a limited way at the moment, with the exception of Hungary, probably, a few other places, mainly just on sugary drinks. Um, I do think where there is very rapid expansion of um, on healthy foods, we need to consider taxation on those products. Sugar reduction program in the UK shows massive expansion of confectionery sales. Um, and a lot of money is being made out of that, and we need to consider appropriate action. I think what the sugar levy has showed, though, that taxing the companies is a pretty good way to go, as opposed to taxing the individuals. And before the sugar levy came on, we modelled the potential impact, and the impact has been much greater than we predicted. So there, there are lessons to learn from that. I do think we need to consider fiscal inf intervention too for the, for the fast food industry because of the very, very rapid expansion. During the pandemic, um, big fast food providers expanded by 11%. They are making much more money. Um, 
So, yeah, I'd like to see more fiscal, frankly. So, so uh, but you, you say that the sugar, we know the sugar in soft drinks has fallen dramatically. Yeah. But sugar consumption remains the same because it's still being produced, it's still being consumed in different foods. In yes, consumption. so... So, the, you have to go back one step further to the food Potentially. Supply. So, Henry Dimbleby did suggest putting uh, a tax on sugar production. Um, um, and... Uh, and that's another possibility. The tax would need to be quite high to influence the, the price of the product, and we do have food inflation going on at the moment. Um, so it's, that's, a, that's another whole meeting in its own right, really. Um, I'm quite aware that um, the, the lady on the front row, Loretta, had, had her hand up as well. Thank you. Um, both of you... Uh, highlighted the point that most people know the advice but don't follow it um, and that um, particularly um, you professor um, highlighted that psychological factors are quite uh, important in overeating and, and stress we think we are hungry but actually we are stressed so my question is, is there intervention planned which is based on decreasing stress? So, for example, um, an intervention like yoga. You mentioned, um, uh, Alison, that um, increasing physical activity is going to have little effect on um, making up for the uh, calorie excess. but yoga works not by increasing physical activity so much as affecting the desire to eat by making us aware of when we are actually hungry or not. Um, and uh, in India now, every school child, I believe, does yoga every day. Um, in this country, we're encouraging school children to run around the playground before school in primary schools but um, maybe uh, an intervention like yoga that affects mental health could be um, part of the answer. Um, I think, so the, there is, I'm, I'm entirely pro-physical activity for reasons that you explain that physical activity is incredibly good for a whole range of health outcomes, including ones around mental health. And there is, there is evidence around depression reduction, for example, with physical activity. I think to the, there are lots of things that are hypothetical for nutrition. Hypothetical. They're, they're, um, they're theoretical, um, and there is evidence from them, from animal models, from various things. But, but to have them as a national initiative, you really require quite a bit of evidence. So um, it's quite hard to say that yoga specifically would be a, a sensible intervention to promote as part of the obesity solution, but I've got no doubt it's part, you know, very helpful in a well-being, a well-being sense. So, so um, yeah, evidence, evidence, evidence. Because I, my job was as a chief, chief nutritionist, I had to be very driven by the evidence because taxpayers' money was being spent. Thank you. Let me, Julia. Yoga yapıyor musun? Uh, Julian, do you do yoga? Do you practice yoga? yoga? Do you practice yoga? <laughs> Professor Aisha, do you practice yoga or in the United Arab Emirates? Part of the, you know, the country that, you know, you're coming from. Uh, Is there any, any, you know, uh, physical activity in specific terms in you know regulating the you know the body uh. thank you professor for moving from discussion to you to me 
yes. throwing the ball to me. <laughs> to me. Uh, actually, uh, uh, physical activity, uh, we are trying to incorporate physical activity starting from kindergarten to, to uh, school. However, when um, individuals and children grow uh, in age, uh, it will be their personal you know, um, decision either to continue in this physical activity or being physically active or uh, sedentary uh, what, what, what following. What do you mean physically active? That three hours, mm. four hours for me in one day? Or what do you mean? I, I will say in the Gulf region. The open yeah. area to discuss. Yes. In four hours, five hours, uh, three hours. What do you mean? Uh, I'm you glad know, I'm not uh, one of your students. <laughs> <laughs> now we are under the uh, hot seat, you know. But uh, in, uh, going back to the phys uh, being physically active population in UAE, we are not uh, a population that uh, is similar to UK, for example. UK, they use... Uh, walking and their their lifestyle is different than the gulf region especially because due to the temperature thank you very much um, i th think we take you, one last question, last question because of we're running into lunchtime um so this gentleman over there that requires a microphone no i did, I did my phd in uk oh did you yeah, UK. so thank you very much uh, uh, thank you for the both uh, presentation hello and uh, I think uh, we should uh, have a holistic approach to the uh, nutrition uh, problem all over. The one side, uh, we need uh, food safety. One side, the sustainable uh, food production. That means uh, it's the uh, security. On the other side is nutrition. So all those uh, subjects, uh, interfere each other so that we have to uh, approach in a very holistic way. Otherwise, if you look at only the milk consumption or other, we cannot solve the problem. So this is the need uh, we have to approach uh, really in a holistic uh, uh, way so that uh, we can identify uh, the problem. Uh, that, uh, the, the, that, therefore, we need a strategic plan for Turkey, but also in other countries, I see in UK, you have some that. Uh, is there any strategic plan for Turkey, Tanju? Um, can I make one comment? Um, 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 so I think you have to be careful, actually, um, integrating physical activity into an obesity strategy, because it's the easy option politically. And so that my experience that that means that it's much easier for politicians to grab onto it and they grab on to physical activity initiatives rather than trying to pre rather than trying to really do hard things about about the food supply so so i am always cautious about being uh, uh, being too holistic for that very reason, because you get dilution of the of the intervention, but um, you know that's um, my opinion. I think we need to stop. Yeah, actually. we need to stop. It's coming from Ufi. Laura. So, in terms of physical activity and. Well, I, I would agree with what, what has been said by Alison uh, in the sense that physical activity obviously has many health advantages. So uh, I don't think anyone is saying that we should not be physically active. It's more that from an obesity prevention strategy at a population level, that would not be sufficient. Thank you. Thank yeah, you very thank much. you very much for this session. Uh, for the virtu virtual audiences, please note that we will come back at 3 o'clock uh, Turkish time. So it's a uh, lunch break. Enjoy your lunch. Uh, there will be guidance uh, to you as well. Uh, and see you later at 3 uh, p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Welcome back to session three of this amazing conference. This session will focus on obesity, diabetes, and hidden hunger, and we will have three speakers. Our first speaker from the University of Istanbul is Professor Ilman Satman. She's Professor of Internal Medicine and Endocrinology within the medical faculty. Professor Satman has a broad interest in cardiometabolic disease and uh, has headed the Division of Diabetes and the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism in previous years. She chaired the Turkish Institute of Public Health and Chronic Diseases until I think very recently. Uh, we welcome you here and we look forward to your presentation on public health initiatives to address obesity and diabetes in Turkey. Professor Satman. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, first of all, thank you for the nice intro and uh, a special thank, thank, yeah, of course, mm -hmm. for the organizing committee to give me the opportunity to uh, share my experience and gain your experiences. So uh, my topic is uh, public health initiatives uh, to address obesity and diabetes in Turkey. My talk will be in two parts. The first part is uh, talking about the situation about diabetes and obesity in Turkey in terms of epidemiologic field survey and re recently the uh, estimates and projections about uh, these two conditions. And then I will talk about the initiatives and some projects. Uh, there is a global uh, obesity pandemic uh, for the recent years. And here uh, some uh, we from the WHO, according to WHO uh, recent, I mean, reports, in from uh, 1975 to 2016, uh, obesity tripled, uh, increased, um, and in 2016, more than 1.9 billion adults, uh, 18 years and over, uh, were either overweight or obesity. And of this, about 650 million uh, are obese. And 39, or uh, nowadays they are talking about slightly about 40% of adults aged 18 years and over uh, were overweight in 2016. And 13% uh, of uh, them are obese. In this slide, you can see the uh, OECD obesity update report, uh, which is published in 2017. And accordingly, you can see the situation in Turkey. If I can recognize it, I can see it from here, sorry. Yeah, it's slightly about the uh, average in, uh, uh, I mean, orange and in Turkey, it's slightly above the average. And uh, more than one in two adults and nearly one in every six children uh, were either overweight or obese, according to these uh, countries. Here you can see our field surveys. We uh, have the uh, opportunity to run two uh, population-based surveys, first one in 1998 and the second one in 2010. Uh, the uh, special condition uh, related to this in each one of uh, these surveys, field surveys, we have the opportunity to screen for uh, a number of uh, non-communicable diseases and also evaluate the lifestyle uh, by the uh, uh, questionnaire, uh, specifically design questionnaire each time. We, uh, I mean, reviewed about 25,000 people, including the oral glucose tolerance test and other biochemical surveys. Uh, so in terms of obesity in 1998, 
uh, if you can see the purple, the red, and the blue uh, side, and also the uh, orange side, uh, all together are overweight and obese people. It's about 50%, uh, uh, slightly over 50%. On the right side, uh, we uh, uh, go to the same uh, 540 centers, villages, and uh, I mean uh, districts uh, in all over the country. And according to the, uh, let's say, age and uh, sex specific uh, randomized uh, participants, we uh, look uh, to the situation again about 12 years about apart and uh, we, s we have seen that uh, although it, in the purple one if you can see the overweight people is not changed a lot from 35 to 37 percent of course this is a rough uh, I mean, uh, uh, rate and uh, the uh, obesity is increased from 22 altogether to 35 percent if I can go and if you can look more, uh, I mean, carefully, uh, on the left side, you can see the situation in female and the uh, uh, right side in the male. The blue one is the first survey, and the uh, red, uh, red uh, I mean, columns are the second survey. You can see the rate of increase in five-year age intervals. And uh, if you can see uh, from the first uh, survey and the second survey, Female uh, obesity is more prevalent than men, and also male. And also, if you can see, uh, from the uh, very early age, I'm mean younger age to the uh, late middle age, uh, obesity is almost always uh, higher uh, than men. Uh, but uh, on the right side, we, uh, you can quickly recognize it. Uh, the rate of increase in obesity is uh, especially in the middle age and uh, yeah, early uh, late age uh, or elderly age. Obesity, uh, the rate of increased obesity uh, is increasing uh, more than women. So over 12 years, obesity increased in, uh, by 34% in women and more than 100% in men. Here you can see the estimates and projections of obesity. Before the pandemic in 2020, we, we were prepared for the third survey in the same centers. But after the pandemic, we couldn't go there. And instead of that, we used the population-based uh, census, uh, which is published each year officially, and uh, look for the estimated uh, age uh, and sex-specific uh, uh, obesity rates, and then uh, we uh, projected the uh, obesity rate by uh, 2045. And uh, we also specifically look for the elderly uh, population because the elderly population is increasing uh, so rapidly in Turkey. Uh, nowadays, 9.7% of the uh, population are 65 years and older. Uh, I mean, it's not a lot for the UK. <laughs> I know it's about 20, I think, uh, there. Uh, but I mean, it's increasing rapidly. Uh, so, uh, and the, this condition, this two condition, is uh, quite common among elderly. So here you can see from 2010 to 2021, the rate of increase in obesity in, uh, let's say, million uh, population uh, uh, with, uh, living with obesity uh, by, as the new term, I think we have to use not obese people or obesity, uh, people living with obesity. So they, they are increasing, although the rate uh, is uh, remarkable in two. Uh, briefly, I can say that uh, in May in 2010, there was about 5.5 million people. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. Yeah, there was about 5.5 uh, uh, million male living with obesity. In 2020, we uh, estimated about 7 million uh, male living with obesity. And uh, for the case of female, it was 8.9 million, and now it's reached to 11.5 million. 
Uh, here for the central obesity, in the left side, we use our population specific weight uh, circumference cutoff point, which is uh, for male it's 96 centimeter and for female it's 91 centimeter. And on the right side, you can see the universal uh, WHO def definition for central obesity. 100 O and uh, 2 and uh, 88 centimeters, the cutoff point. And you can see in both situations, uh, obesity, central obesity is increasing. It's a huge uh, problem in the elderly, but uh, the universal central obesity uh, definition is not suitable for our population, especially for female. So uh, then we come to diabetes. According to the uh, recent Diabetes Atlas 10th edition, uh, they are talking about, uh, uh, as you know, uh, to, uh, people population between 20 to 80 uh, years old. Uh, this, uh, in 2021, uh, the IDF Diabetes at Atlas estimates that uh, one in 10 people uh, have diabetes, and this equates to 537 million in the world, uh, and by 2030, this number is expected to increase to 643 million, and by uh, 2045, it's going to uh, reach to 784 million. So the rate of increase uh, from uh, 2021 to 2045 uh, will be nearly 50%. An estimated 10% of the world's population uh, have uh, diabetes, and the prevalence is predicted to, uh, to rise 11.3% uh, by 2030 and over 12% by 2045. Sorry. And according to the same atlas, uh, Turkey is ranked the first top uh, countries. In, in Europe uh, in terms of uh, diabetes prevalence and also uh, the uh, population in, uh, with diabetes, living with diabetes. As you can see, it's 40.5% and 9 million people uh, is uh, estimated to have diabetes. Here you can see our two surveys. Uh, again, in five-year uh, uh, age intervals. The blue one is the first uh, survey, and the uh, red one is the columns, uh, is the second survey. And uh, diabetes increasing from very early age to uh, elderly age, but uh, the, the remarkable increase in those who are uh, older than 60 years of age. Uh, in that uh, population group, uh, everyone in uh, three person has diabetes, uh, and uh, diabetes is uh, unrecognized in the very early age, as you can see here, and also very late age. So overall, uh, diabetes was 7.2% in 1998. And it increased by 90% within 12 years and reached to 13.7%. 13, uh, 13 and the rate of increase, again, is high, slightly higher among male than female. So it means we will have a huge problem in male uh, in the recent years, I think, uh, future years. So this is the previously known and undiagnosed or new diabetes by age group again. The blue one is previously known, and the uh, red one is uh, unrecognized or newly diagnosed uh, diabetes during the survey. And it's about 44% uh, or 45% of people are not aware of their disease uh, for a couple of years, probably, uh, in Turkey. Here you can see the estimates for uh, uh, 2021. And uh, all together, if you can see the overall, 7.3% uh, of the uh, population have uh, new diabetes, and 8.6% of the population estimated to have uh, previously known diabetes. And on the uh, right side, uh, the, uh, the situation in the elderly, it's about 2.2 fold uh, higher uh, diabetes rate among the elderly compared to the general population. 
Here you can see the estimates between 2010 to 2020, and on the top uh, right side, the estimates for between 1998 to 2020 and projections for 2023 and 2045. And on the uh, lower side, uh, on the left, the uh, regional uh, uh, distribution of diabetes. And on the uh, right side, uh, lower panel, uh, the uh, comparative prevalence according to the standard European population and the world population, because our population is still younger than uh, the Western population. And it should be, uh, in the near future, maybe more than uh, the uh, recent situation. Uh, in terms of prediabetes, this is the diabetes atlas situation. And they said uh, 541 million adults worldwide, or one in 10, uh, have impaired glucose tolerance. And uh, over 300 million adults, uh, or one in 18, have impaired fasting glucose. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is the situation in our last survey. Uh, and uh, if you can see the uh, left panel uh, and the last column, uh, altogether 30% of the adult population have any degree of uh, um, prediabetes in terms of IFG, IGT, or both of them. On the right side, uh, the high-risk population, again, a, a, a kind of a prediabetic situation, and it's about 23%. And in, in every uh, occasion, the female are more, uh, prominent, have a more prominent prediabetes rate than uh, male. So after uh, this, uh, I mean, introduction about the problem of uh, obesity and diabetes in Turkey, we develop, uh, I, I'm personally working, and uh, due to the, my, uh, I mean, position in the uh, National Health Institute, uh, from uh, very, uh, I mean, recent years in my profession, uh, I, uh, I'm going, uh, I'm, I'm uh, continuing to work with the Minister of Health, and uh, uh, sometimes advisory, sometimes I mean as a working lay person with them uh, to develop these action plans and some projects and so. This is the action plan for prevention and control of adult and childhood obesity and increased physical activity in Turkey, the term for uh, 2019 and 2023. And we have a uh, four uh, chapter in this action plan, current status of obesity in the world and in Europe, uh, action plan for termination of childhood uh, obesity, and of course in Turkey, I uh, forgot to write it, sorry. Physical activity action plan, monitoring, evaluation, and research uh, in the field. The action plan is implemented in the uh, awareness uh, studies, campaigns, public training, service training, in-service trainings for the healthcare professionals, developing standards, guidelines, and legislative arrangements, reorganization of healthcare services, monitoring, and evaluation of the applied research. So uh, this uh, part is going to uh, be presented, I think, uh, tomorrow uh, in the morning session, I think, by uh, Professor Nazan Yardım. So she will talk about all these uh, projects. So for the sake of time, I'm going to leave it. Uh, then uh, we uh, developed uh, Turkey Nutrition Guide uh, according to the uh, Mediterranean-based diet. And nowadays, they are, uh, I mean, uh, updating the uh, guide, nutrition guide. And within a couple of uh, months, I think, it's under review. Uh, it will be uh, published. Uh, besides that, Diabetes edu Educators Guide for the Primary Healthcare Institutions, desktop training set for adults with diabetes, and again, a desktop uh, training set for children with diabetes, also prepared. 
Here you can see the guide to medical nutrition therapy ex exercise metabolism and also on the left uh, obesity uh, diagnosis and treatment guidelines which was developed uh, by the Turkish Society for Endocrinology and Metabolism Working Group for uh, Obesity. And similarly, we are developing guidelines and updating uh, them for diabetes also. And uh, it, it, with the terms of uh, obesity action plan, uh, I mean, restrict, restriction of advertisement to uh, children, especially for, uh, I mean, advertisement of uh, sweetened beverage and uh, other candies and so. Nutrition friendly school program, she will talk about uh, the school milk program. And we have changed some uh, curriculum and increased the, uh, I mean, time for the physical education during the primary school and high schools to uh, increase the awareness and uh, gain the physical activity uh, for the children. Uh, Here you can see the first uh, diabetes uh, prevention, Turkey di uh, first uh, diabetes prevention and control program action plan for 2011 and 2014. And after that, uh, we uh, prepared the second one for the uh, term 2015-2020. And here we have uh, five uh, objectives. Uh, policy development and implementation of uh, effective diabetes management, preventing diabetes and ensuring early diagnosis, providing effective treatment of diabetes and also its complications, improving childhood diabetes care treatment and preventing uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity in children, effective monitoring and evaluation of diabetes and diabetes program. Of course, each of the objective has a purpose and action plan and uh, the, uh, I mean, projects. Uh, but uh, for the time uh, sake, I'm not going to into detail. The four and the five. So here, uh, the uh, Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism of Turkey uh, diabetes guideline. We started this guideline to, uh, I mean, prepare in 2016, and nowadays we are uh, working on the 15th edition. And when I was uh, dealing with the public health in the uh, health, public health institute, we developed this uh, Turkish elderly health report for the first time in Turkey, the current status, problems, and short and medium term solutions. And we provided this for all the st stakeholders, including the Minister of Health and uh, the other people. And during this process, uh, we involved in a couple of, uh, I mean, European consortium projects, uh, starting from sixth uh, framework to seventh framework, especially the, uh, about the development of diabetes prevention program and uh, national standards. And then uh, we prepared uh, the diabetes prevention uh, program for uh, uh, the patients and their relatives and uh, for uh, diabetes control. And also uh, the sixth, uh, seventh uh, framework program, a predice project, uh, the proposal uh, of this uh, title was early prevention of diabetes complication in Europe. I mean, during the stage of IGT and or uh, IFG, we uh, pharmacologically treated or uh, followed these uh, patients for three years in uh, different centers in Europe, and uh, our uh, center was one of the collaborators. And uh, the municipalities as uh, local uh, management, uh, I mean, health management uh, uh, authorities, of course, uh, working with us from time to time. This is for the changing obesity for, uh, for the well-being and health of people in Istanbul. And uh, they aim to change the obes obesity. And uh, they are, uh, I mean, involved with a couple of projects. If they started from definition of the problem, causes and risk factors, health, social, and economic burdens of diabetes, uh, uh, I mean, obesity in uh, Istanbul, epidemiology of obesity, and combating uh, activities. IBB is the Istanbul municipality. And they, uh, uh, they aim to increase the quality of healthcare services first. 
uh, they have some healthcare services and uh, then they recognize it's not enough. Uh, there's a need for intersectoral uh, uh, studies uh, aiming to change the uh, lifestyle culture and individual awareness demanding healthcare services and gaining positive lifestyle behaviors are also important. And here you can see the obesity prevalence in Istanbul. Obesity prevalence in Istanbul in 1998 was 20.6%. Uh, 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 in 2010, it increased to 29.8%. And estimates for uh, 2021 uh, show that uh, it's 31.6%. And projections to uh, 2045 showing us 35%. Uh, the population with obesity in 1998 was 1.3 million. It increased nearly to 2.7, more than doubled. And the 2021 estimates showing us 3.6 million. And the male and female, in parentheses you can see, and female are double than male. In Istanbul, each year, uh, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, about 100,000 uh, new people identified with uh, obesity or living with uh, obesity is adding to the obesity population. Uh, they are uh, talking about the uh, causes of obesity and they, do, uh, they arrange a, a couple of meetings and workshops through the academic people and also the uh, Minister of Health and other uh, stakeholders. And uh, they, uh, I mean, aim to energy dense nutrition, overnutrition, global increase in uh, fat and carbohydrate intake, transportation, urbanization, and uh, physical activity, decrease in physical activity and sedentary lifestyle. This is the implicating main factors for uh, obesity in Istanbul. And uh, two main factors uh, they uh, focused, uh, planning, tr uh, planning uh, trainings on obesity to increase health literacy at all age and uh, starting from childhood, providing adequate and balanced nutrition as well as uh, uh, adequate physical activity. Here you can see some, uh, I mean, uh, pictures from these activities and the website or webinars during the pandemic years and uh, workshops. And they are also uh, with their other, uh, I mean, uh, parts. Uh, ISADEM is a, a, a group in, within the municipality for the social and health issues of uh, female and children. And also the uh, UAMUS Istanbul, I mean, our uh, home, uh, it's a kind of nursery in uh, Istanbul municipality, and they increase the number of these, uh, I mean, centers and working together. Uh, and they have some ongoing projects, the Pedalist project, uh, open area morning sport activities. Uh, Pelemir, a kind of plant added to bread. Uh, I personally work in, in that project at the university. And purple mixed bread, uh, purple mixed plant, to increase the antioxidant capacity of the bread, assessing the healthy and safe food uh, project, online exercise and physical activity and wellness project so are some of them. And the last I would like to briefly mention about the Open uh, Turkey uh, initiative. The Obesity Policy Engagement Network is a, a kind of, uh, I mean, a consortium, let's say, or platform sometimes to uh, increase the awareness about obesity and uh, uh, debate, uh, open debate about the problem of obesity. And also the industry involved in this and the municipality involved in this industry, of course, uh, I mean, bringing the uh, game to the pharmacologic treatment and of obesity and municipality bringing some other issues. But we are working together uh, as stakeholders they also defined the uh, I mean, problem in Turkey and uh, also the adult obesity. 
as I mentioned uh, with the studies, and they define some clinical challenges to awareness of obesity being a disease is quite high, and current system and tools uh, are not effective to, su to support people with obesity, and uh, physicians are not uh, recognize the problem uh, seriously. 29% of the patients are aware that they are overweight and obese, and most of them, they are not obese but, or under-recognized or uh, something uh, like that. And uh, the uh, Open Turkey aims to facilitate an open debate on obesity and build national support and, uh, for improving obesity care in Turkey. I think it's finished. We have uh, four core focuses, recognizing obesity as a treatable chronic relapsing disease, developing action plans uh, on the part of policymakers, reaching target audiences, focusing on the health economy and social impact areas. And here the council member, I'm one of them. Uh, I can switch this. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs> The questions later. Thank you very much, Professor Sapman. Um, our next speaker is Professor Mike Lean from the University of Glasgow. Mike Lean is Professor of Human Nutrition and a consultant physician in the Glasgow Royal Infirmary. He has a stellar research career which covers a remarkably broad area. He's worked on molecular mechanisms through which nutrition has effects, through to public health interventions and uh, tackling clinical, clinical problems. He's also not been afraid to tackle political problems, and I think that's been a feature of uh, uh, his uh, working life. He's had a long-term interest in type 2 diabetes, and particularly in how we might manage that condition. Mike, over to you. Thank, thank you. <coughs> thank, thank you very much, John. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, we're all bewildered by the rising numbers of cases of obesity, and the last talk gave a clear example to this. Um, and yet, with all these initiatives, all the education, we have very little effect. I'm going to focus, and I have, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to focus on one small part of the story which gives you perhaps an answer to one small part of the problem. So, this, um, my title is, is given here. I'm going to point out the, the painting in this, this slide. It's a painting by Frederick Banting, who exactly 100 years ago won Nobel Prize for discovering insulin. He didn't really discover insulin. He was in the laboratory at the time, but he was a very good painter. And, and this is a, a famous painting by Frederick Banting, uh, and another painting by him here. I have some disclosures here, and I'll point out that if you want more information about the direct trial, they're all, a lot of the slides and information, all the publications are on the website here, www.directclinicaltrial.org.uk. Org means it's a charity, it's not a commercial organization. Now, type 2 diabetes, and I'm a specialist trained in diabetes, working in hospitals, working at a public health level. And I was taught as a student, type 2 diabetes is a chronic disease, um, it affects old people, it's permanent, it's not curable, and it's progressive. So if the patient lives maybe 10, 15 years, they will develop complications and problems. But most of our patients, when it was diagnosed in their 70s and 80s, they didn't get problems. And so we said, okay, take a tablet, come back in one year. And after one year, maybe take two tablets and come back in one year, like this. And the patients thought, it's an inconvenience. I don't feel anything. Why should I take these tablets? They didn't take the tablets. Now, type 2 diabetes is our commonest cause of blindness, of kidney failure, of, of, of um, amputations because of ulceration, gangrene. It causes dementia. It's causing heart disease and strokes. It has increased cancer risks. And it's very, very expensive disease. 
And the reason is that instead of developing diabetes age 70, now it's nearer 50, in, and globally, and including the United Kingdom. And here are some, just some numbers for you. These diseases are big diseases. Breast cancer, you don't want breast cancer. Women, you don't want breast cancer. But your survival would be 80% at 10 years. Nobody wants a lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, serious cancer, but your survival is 60% at 10 years. Type 2 diabetes, 50% at 10 years. This is a very bad disease, and we have underestimated it. We have not understood type 2 diabetes. It's a very serious disease, equivalent to a cancer. And if we had chemotherapy, and I said you have diabetes, it's a cancer, take chemotherapy, you would take it every day without fail. But instead we say, oh, we have a diet. And you say, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. So it's different. And we, we know a lot about the uh, mortality reduction with type 2 diabetes. This is from a very large European study. And it just tells us that some of that mortality, a large part is from premature heart disease, but also a lot are excess cancer deaths. And there are other deaths from diabetes related to the condition, not directly caused by diabetes, but the mortality is elevated. We know very well that this disease does not occur if you are not overweight. So, if you have a body mass index 22 to 20, 21, 22, and this is me, it's very unlikely that you develop type 2 diabetes. Very unlikely. If you develop diabetes, it's probably not type 2. It's a very good place to be for other reasons. And the risk of diabetes becomes serious with a body mass index 24 to 21. The relative risk here is eightfold. That's a huge risk with a body mass index 24. And look at these relative risks. This is a condition which is obesity related, but not just um, a comorbidity. It is not a comorbidity. This is a causal relationship. It's a, it's a consequence of weight gain. These figures cannot be purely by chance. This is a causal relationship with re relative risks up to 100 fold. Now, I learned about the pathophysiology of diabetes. I'm not going to spend a long time here, but we understood that we developed diabetes as a pathway <clears throat> when perhaps for genetic reasons, there is some kind of insulin resistance in the tissues, in your muscle in particular. Um, and with age, this pathway progresses uh, in such a way that there are alterations to the way our um, body fat is metabolized. We have hyperinsulinemia because the beta cells start to overproduce insulin. They produce extra insulin, high insulin levels, to combat resistance. There's then um, increased glucose output from the liver. Uh, there is a beta cell decompensation at a late stage with impaired glucose tolerance, maybe for one year, two years, three years, and then diabetes. This pathway is very well known, but I recognize that we can identify many parts here where weight gain is contributing to the process. And we also know very well that for people with prediabetes, if they are overweight, have prediabetes, if they lose just a little weight, if they lose a little, seven kilograms in this big study, this is the diabetes prevention study in North America. We have almost identical data from Jaco Tumileto's study in Finland and others from China. If you lose seven kilograms, and it's not well maintained, it's quite well maintained for four years, there's a, more than half of all the diabetes is prevented. And these data can be continued now for 10 years. They've been followed up. And that, there's a legacy effect from this intervention for 10 years. You can prevent most type 2 diabetes with quite modest weight loss. And we're not very good at maintaining the weight loss. We'll, we'll learn more about that later. A very old study from Scotland told us that for people who um, were overweight, BMI over 25, and they were aged 64 at diagnosis, if they lost weight, they lived longer. So if they did not lose weight, they lost about seven years of life. They died seven years younger because of their diabetes compared to people with no diabetes. As they lost weight, so they lived longer. And at the end, we had data up to 14 years. At this point, 14, 15 years, if they lost 15, uh, sorry, this is weight loss in kilograms, 15 kilograms, if they lost 15 kilograms in one year, in the first year, they lived the same time as people who never had diabetes. 
So it, possibly the disease process had been reversed. We didn't have uh, follow-up data. We didn't have uh, prospective data. But these were also followed by another study in North America from David Williamson, similar data, showing weight loss helps people to live longer if they have diabetes. And the bariatric surgeons, are there any surgeons here? They published their best results. They only published good results. They never published the bad results. But they told us, look, if people have bariatric surgery, they live longer. Their diabetes will help them live longer. And 72% no longer diabetic after two years. After two years, 75%. These are different studies, different operations with weight loss. 72, 75, 68, 85% of patients no longer diabetic after two years. After 10 or six years in the green, the, the remission rates are, are less, so there's one, they, they revert into diabetes, and partly because there's late weight regain. So we know weight loss will prevent diabetes and will correct it if we have bariatric surgery. But these are showing weight losses of 23%, 35%, 33%, huge weight losses with many side effects, complications. How much weight do you need to lose to remove diabetes? And the answer came from one study in Australia from John Dixon. These are individual patients. In the dark are people at two years who are, who are, who are still diabetic, and in the open symbols, those who are not diabetic. On the left, gastric band surgery. On the right, diabetes clinic. And you can see nearly all remain diabetic after two years. One here is not, another. After bariatric surgery, 73% no longer diabetic. And I put a line here at, is it 10 kilograms or 15 kilograms? But somewhere here, 83% of patients no longer diabetic if they lose 10 or 15% of weight. It's a very small study. We don't know if it's 10% or 15. Uh, it's uh, like this. And that was the basis for designing the um, uh, direct, the diabetes remission clinical trial, which was conducted in Scotland, and this is mostly Scotland, and a little bit of England here, where John Mathers lives, down here, uh, right at the bottom. Thank you, John. And um, this was a study conducted by general practitioners in the, in, in, the in the villages, in the small towns, not in hospital. The patients stayed in their homes. They visited their local doctor. And the intervention was conducted in this way because we wanted to see if we can deliver from the beginning an intervention which real people in real life can follow. Um, and we randomized the, the practices to receive um, either control treatment, which uses our guidelines, uh, sign guidelines in England, uh, in Scotland, NICE guidelines in England, um, and the intervention practice had the same guidelines plus a diet program which was uh, developed for this purpose called Counterweight Plus, and I can explain that. We recruited, and we had a very high uptake. Almost 30% of people approached said, no, we can stop holidays, we can change our lives to do this two-year trial, two-year randomized control trial. It's a big undertaking. Um, and they were very ordinary people, aged 54, BMI 35, hemoglobin A1C, 59 millimoles per mole, um, on treatment. And they had diabetes for less than six years, not yet on insulin. Um, and importantly, many of these came from high deprivation parts of the country. They were randomized, as I say, to take, to take this intervention or not. The intervention was, was unusual because on day one, we said, you must stop your diabetes tablets and your blood pressure tablets. That was very attractive to people. They don't like taking tablets. Many of them don't take them anyway, but also, we were doing this for safety reasons because if they continue to take anti-diabetes treatment, they may have hypoglycemia with rapid weight loss. And if they continue with antihypertensive or diuretic treatments, they would have postural hypertension, and that's a serious complication. So we asked them to stop completely the tablets, and we would, we would monitor and replace if necessary. They then had 12 weeks of total diet replacement, and that was roughly 850 calories a day of a formula diet which was complete in vitamins and minerals, so entirely safe. Three months could be extended if they have holidays or some kind of difficulty, and we allowed them to continue a little longer to be inclusive of everybody with social complications to this trial, uh, up to 20 weeks. They then introduced foods as meals with guidance from the dietitians, but that guidance started on day one. So they were told in 12 weeks, you will then start to introduce Firstly, breakfast, 
then lunchtime, and then an evening meal. To, just, to prepare them to do this, to prepare them to be able to select foods which would avoid weight regain. That's the plan. And that leads on to weight loss maintenance uh, for up to two years. We continue to collect data now for five years, and I, I can't give you all the results, but I can hint at them. Then the total diet replacement, a very ordinary formula diet, really the same as you find in, in many supermarkets, um, as long as it's complete for all vitamins and minerals. Um, and many different flavors. The food reintroduction was at this stage that we, uh, we asked people to take more physical activity if they can do it. We know that asking people to take physical activity whilst losing weight is very difficult. They, they most cannot do this. And indeed, we discovered that most of our patients with type 2 diabetes were unable to increase physical activity. They maintained, but they could not increase physical activity. It's very difficult for them, perhaps because their muscle fibers are largely type 2 and they, they, um, they have a lack of the muscle fibers required for endurance activity which is good for diabetes. Um, and the maintenance diet in the end was very similar to a UK diet so approximately 50, it wasn't high in carbohydrate, it wasn't low in carbohydrate. We allowed flexibility to, to be able to maintain every, every participant. So they could elect to have more or less, but on average, 50% carbohydrate, 35% fat, 15% protein. I hope Alison thinks that's a nice diet program to offer them. Thank you, Alison. Um, so that was the intervention. The study was designed with an outcome at 12 months, at one year, when we wished to achieve a target of 22% freedom from diabetes, remission of diabetes. And by that, we mean hemoglobin A1c not diabetic, below diagnostic threshold, with no medication for 12 months. We aimed this, we assumed a 5% remission rate in the control group because some people will, will hear about the, the um, intervention, they read the newspapers, and sometimes people leak things to newspapers. Um, we had to get 280 patients to achieve power. In fact, we recruited more than 300. It was a very popular study. And the results surprised everybody. Instead of 22%, we achieved 46% people who were no longer taking medication, who had no longer diabetes after 12 months. And that was with a mean weight loss of 10 kilograms in this group. Um, at two years, that figure had fallen to 36% with a mean weight loss at that stage of eight kilograms. And this tells a story that the, the loss here, if you, if you can read the small writing from 68 to 53, um, patients, that means there were relapses, uh, uh, there were 15 people whose weight regained to a point which was closer to baseline than 10 kilograms. And it seemed that after this that remaining 10 kilograms below baseline avoided or maintained the, the remission of diabetes. Um, and this is a slide which John showed at least part of it earlier which shows that the weight loss achieved remissions very, very sustainably. So at the right-hand side here, these are the people who lost over 15 kilograms. At one year, 86%, almost 9 out of 10, no longer diabetic. At two years, 82%. So if they were able to maintain that weight loss, they, remain, they maintained remission. Similarly, those who maintained a weight loss of 10 to 15 kilograms um, also retained those remissions for at least two years. And this seemed to be the, this, uh, this is the recurrent message that if you can lose weight and maintain the weight loss, diabetes will remain away. So that was the important, single most important message from this study. Um, I mentioned we stopped the antihypertensive and diuretic medication. Some doctors were very anxious about stopping these medications. Oh, the blood pressure will rise suddenly, they say, if you stop these medications. No, we replaced these drugs with a more effective treatment. And weight loss is more effective than drugs for high blood pressure. And we show this because in the study, <coughs> in the white line are people who had no medication for their blood pressure. And you can see the fall in blood pressure is on average mean 15 millimeters of mercury, half of the patients more than this. And, and this was the big risk of postural hypertension uh, if they continued medication. And they, this was at the end of the, the total diet replacement period, the average blood pressure fell by 10 millimeters of mercury, much more than any drug treatment. Um, 
Those who had one medication was in the green line, and you can see their blood pressures fell to the same point. And those who were on two or three or three medications, for, and sometimes plus diuretics, um, in the yellow, and again, their blood pressures did not rise uh, but, and fell to approximately the same level, about 10 milliliters of mercury at the end of the total diet replacement period. Uh, now, some of that was because about a third, 30% of the patients did require to return onto medication once their weight loss ceased and they then saw a rise in blood pressure. But this was easily managed by their general practitioners. We looked at, um, as any good clinical trial, at clinical events and serious adverse events in the study. There was no significant difference in, in the year one um, and then in year two, in the second year, 12 to 24 months, we saw a significantly more serious adverse events in the control group. That's very unusual for a clinical trial. And the reason for that is that there were a large number of vascular diabetes-related serious adverse events in the control group, not in the intervention group. So the diet, uh, and these are very early data, suggests that there's a reduction in the diabetes-related morbidities at this stage. And this is very exciting. It's very short-term data. Um, and we're now looking at the five-year data. And I'm very optimistic that we may be able to present something exciting soon. So to conclude this, this part of the, of the talk, um, giving this intervention, a diet intervention in primary care using a formula diet for 12 weeks and then moving on to a weight maintenance program, had lower hemoglobin A1C with fewer patients requiring medication, lower blood pressure with fewer requiring medication, reduced cardiovascular risk, and reduced uh, medical care costs. That's important for a national health service, but for individuals who pay for their medication or treatment, it's very important, and better quality of life. So just to summarize that, we did a very complicated um, economic analysis, cost-effectiveness analysis, which is published. And I can give you the uh, bottom line here, which is patients of this intervention live longer, feel better, and it costs less. And one of the mysteries is why our National Health Service did not immediately adopt this intervention, ours, I meant theirs. In Scotland, we did, but in England, they didn't. Instead, they introduced all sorts of different interventions, hoping to get the same results. Um, even though it has all these benefits and they're looking for something even cheaper. But why not go with the one which is evidence-based? I think in Scotland, we've, we've done precisely that, so it's exciting. Subsequently, and during the end of the direct trial, we had to move all our management to remote management for, for the weight maintenance. Um, and I've just got some data here, which is very exciting, which tells us that um, if you manage patients entirely remotely, they are at home, you send the formula diet by post, you have telephone, WhatsApp, Zoom, every, email to communicate between a dietitian and the patient, and they like it. Patients like to stay at home and they like personal contact by these means. Weight losses using the, same pro the exact same program um, are showing weight loss of 15 kilograms at 12 weeks and at 12 months also 15 kilograms. So that's even better than face to face. Now, my colleague Roy Taylor and John Mathers and colleagues in Newcastle conducted some very nice mechanistic studies during this trial, which showed, to, to really to confirm the very small studies done in Newcastle earlier, that as patients went into remission, these are shown in blue, patients who had a remission with weight loss, their liver fat fell. Now, the liver fat in people with type 2 diabetes is elevated. It's very high. And that falls dramatically in those who have remission. It did not fall in those who failed to get remission, and it did not fall in the yellow in the patients who relapsed back into diabetes. This is a, these are two-year data, 24 months data. Liver fat fell, VLDL falls, and with that, there's a fall in the fat in the pancreas. And this seems to be very important for the recovery of diabetes. Is there's a loss of the excess fat in the, pan in the pancreas in the patients who respond. Um, and the pancreas, astonishing photographs were taken, and these are all now published, um, showing how with people with type 2 diabetes, their pancreas is a damaged organ. It's a sick organ. It looks, it looks ragged like this. And as two years progress, it slowly fills out to become indistinguishable from normal. And this, on the right is a patient who never had diabetes, a normal pancreas. With the, 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 there's a doubling of the volume of the pancreas, the loss of that um, fractile dimension, the, the ragged outside. And with that, insulin secretion at baseline is half of normal in people with type 2 diabetes, 
Gradually, over two years, that is returned to be normal, the same as people who never had diabetes. So the entire disease process has been reversed in these people who get a remission. And what this is telling us is something very important about populations. In this room, in every population, about 40% of people will have the genes, the genetic background, for metabolic syndrome. If we were to go to the Middle East or to Asia, it could be 50-60%. But in this room, probably Europeans, 40%. 40% of people are different. The 60% the who do not have those genes, if they gain weight with age, they will have a small increase in heart disease risk, quite modest risk. And um, Steve Blair in North America, as you know, has identified some of these people to say these are metabolically fit, obese people. And that's true, up to a point. They have many other problems, and poor Steve Blair himself had his first heart attack age 48. 40% have the genetic background for metabolic syndrome. If they gain weight, fat will accumulate in the liver, in the pancreas, in the internal organs. They will get non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and a high risk, a very high risk of heart disease and of the microvascular complications of diabetes. And what we've shown in direct um, is that it's a very simple thing. We can reverse this process, and that's very exciting, at an early stage, at an early stage in the disease process. Now, just to, just, just to finish off then, um, other studies have looked at remissions now. I've told you about the direct trial here. Diadem-1 carried out in Qatar, Almost identical study, smaller study, with very good uh, weight loss, 12% compared to our average 10. And they had a remission rate at, and this is at one year, of uh, 61% compared to our 46%, but with a higher remission rate in the uh, usual care control group. And this is partly because they're younger people um, with a shorter duration of, of diabetes. There have been several other studies, and they're just here. Three have looked at low-carbohydrate diets, or ketogenic diets, um, the Verta Health study got a 19% remission rate, uh, despite good, good weight loss. So not a very good remission rate, not as good as, as we found in these two studies. Um, David Unwin, a remarkable primary care physician, had a 12.5% remission rate with a, a ketogenic diet. Um, if he, he published the data saying he got 46%, the same here, but his 46% was the people who uh, adhered to the program completely um, if we did the same for, for direct, it would be 73%. Um, and then the Look Ahead trial, biggest study ever done in type 2 diabetes, they had a, a weight loss of nearly 9%, uh, but a remission rate of only 11%. And I think the problem here was that Look Ahead focused very strongly on physical activity and physical fitness, not so much on diet and weight loss. Um, and I'm, I'll just skip this. Everybody knows this lovely study. Um, do we need to use formula diets? The first question everybody asks, and the answer, of course, is no. What we need to do is achieve weight loss. Now, many people can do this by using traditional foods, and we come back to this question about the costs of a healthful diet. If you use very traditional foods, this is a very cheap way of living. In Scotland, we have a thing called the No Diets Diet. It involves porridge and lentil soup to 850 calories, for a weight loss program, and then you can increase the meal sizes, but using this model, a very old-fashioned traditional way of eating. I've had another study, which I'm, I'm leading in Nepal, we're using um, dal bat, very traditional foods in the right quantities. And we can ask people, did you ever eat with your grandparents as a child? Yes. Did you enjoy eating with your grandparents? Yes. What did they feed you? Dal bat. Yes. But they're now, as you know, young people in Nepal, they have all the Western foods to add to it, and this is the problem. So there you go. In summary, I think what we learned from the direct trial, we must treat type 2 diabetes much more seriously and recognize that it is actually just part of obesity. It's the same disease which affects some people, 40%, differently from other people. This is a disease we should treat much more seriously. Um, and we should regard that treatment of weight loss as important as a treatment for our chemotherapy for a cancer. And so with this, we should now be offering people the very best diet program that we can offer from diagnosis with the aim of achieving a remission, but with a focus on long-term maintenance. And that's the big, big problem. The big focus for research should now be long-term maintenance. Um, and then 
the next step is to get into systematic reviews and evidence-based guidelines for routine practice, and that is already happening. Within three, four years of publishing our data, this is already happening. So on that happy note, I should like to thank you very much indeed, and I thank everybody involved in this trial. There's John. Look, he looks a young man with a dark beard. What happened to our beards? I don't know. Here he is. Um, all the, everybody involved, but very specially, Diabetes UK is a charity. It relies entirely on donations from ordinary people, has no government money, uh, and very little commercial money. So this is a, a way to achieve success uh, by committed, committed researchers and committed um, participants. Thank you, John, very much. Mike, thank you very much, as ever, a very inspiring talk. Um, our, our third presenter this afternoon is Professor Nicola Lowe from the University of Central Lancashire in England. Uh, Nicola is trained in uh, biochemistry uh, in the University of Liverpool, spent some time in the US, returned to Liverpool before joining her current university. She's had a long-term interest in trace element nutrition and has done some sterling work overseas, particularly in Pakistan. And this afternoon, she's going to tell us about hidden hunger, global challenges, and importantly, novel solutions. Nicola. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and thank you very much to Nutrition Society and the Sabri Olka Foundation for inviting me to speak to you today. So I'm going to be talking about hidden hunger, um, challenges and solutions. Just by way of overview, um, I'm going to be explaining the concept of hidden hunger. What are the main global concerns? How do we identify it in individuals? And most importantly, how do we address it? So talking about malnutrition, clearly malnutrition just means bad nutrition. And it can be either undernutrition on the one hand or overnutrition and obesity on the other, as we've been hearing a lot about today. And we frequently hear this referred to as the double burden of malnutrition. But we also have something in the middle that overlaps with both micronutrient deficiencies which is often referred to as the triple burden of malnutrition. And this is really where hidden hunger sits. It's referred to as hidden hunger because you can't necessarily tell by looking at an individual that they're suffering from micronutrient deficiencies, but they are there and they are affecting our health and well-being uh, in many ways, as we have heard uh, this morning uh, in, in the presentation about immune function and the importance of micronutrients in maintaining health. So we know that around the globe, two billion people have a low quality diet. And part of the reason for this is that historically, agriculture has focused on calories, on increasing yield, on producing as much food as possible for the ever increasing global population. People who um, live in poverty um, rely on staple foods, staple crops, because they're inexpensive. They tend to be high in calorie and they tend to be low in micronutrients. And when we think about the sustainable development goals, uh, particularly achieving zero hunger, we need to not just to think about calories, but also about how we can improve micronutrient intakes specifically iron, zinc, selenium, iodine, vitamin A, and the B vitamins. Much has been written about this already over the last decade or so, uh, as evidenced by a series in The Lancet in 2008, 2013, and in 2021, talking about the global burden of malnutrition, particularly with a focus on uh, mothers and infants. And of course, we are, as many of you will be aware, right in the middle or past the middle now of the UN Decade of Action on Nutrition, which began in 2016 and will end in 2025. So it seems like this is a good time to reflect on where we are at the moment and how well we are moving towards achieving the zero hunger goals. 
And one useful tool to have a look at where we're at in, uh, by, by country and by region is by having a look at the Food Systems Dashboard, which you can find quite easily on the internet. And this is hosted by Johns Hopkins University and supported by a number of international organizations, which provides a very uh, uh, accessible way of finding out where different countries are at regarding uh, various indices of malnutrition. And I've just pulled up um, some examples. Uh, this first example, sorry, the type is a little small, so you might not be able to read it clearly, but um, just to walk you through it, 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 it um, you, can, you can type in a country of interest, and for this I've typed in Turkey, and it will look at different outcomes and different parameters based on uh, comparison with the region and comparison globally. So here we're looking in the first panel, we're looking at stunting in children under five years, so that's a height for, for age score um, of less than uh, 2.5. And uh, you can see, uh, looking, let's focus on the global data in the palest color. You can see that with time, that stunting rate is uh, increasing, ind indicating increased uh, burden of malnutrition. In the second one, we have wasting, and in the third one, we have overweight. These are children under five years of age, and you can see in the overweight one, it does look like there might be a ray of hope in terms of reducing the uh, obesity in the youngest age range, but clearly that's not happening in adults. Another way of finding out where we're up to in terms of uh, global nutrition is to look at the annual global nutrition report, and I've just pulled out a few key highlights from the most recent report. The report states that to meet global nutrition targets in, in, the most, in most countries, we need accelerated progress. Globally, we're off track to meet five out of the six global maternal infant um, and young children nutrition targets on stunting, wasting, low birth weight, anemia, and childhood overweight. There's a lack of progress, which means that uh, unacceptable uh, levels of malnutrition persist, and the statistics there speak for themselves. Uh, I don't need to read them out to you. It's not all bad news. There are countries that are showing some promising progress towards meeting the nutrition goals. However, no country is on track to achieve the target on reducing salt intake or to halt the rise in adult obesity still a long way to go. So how do we identify individuals uh, at risk or with hidden hunger? Well, it really depends on the nutrient in question. We have two, broadly speaking, two types of, two categories of nutrients, uh, type uh, nutrient deficiencies, a type one nutrient deficiency and a type two nutrient deficiency. For type uh, one nutrients, if you are deficient, growth is uh, relatively normal, tissue levels decrease, and there are specific identifiable symptoms, and examples of these include calcium, iron, and some of the vitamins, and iodine. For type two nutrients, it's a little bit more challenging. If you are deficient, there is a slowing growth rate. Tissue levels uh, can be maintained, and the symptoms are non-specific, and a good example of that is zinc, and I'll talk a little bit more about each of those in a bit more detail. So for a type one nutrient deficiency, uh, we have diagnostic tests that can help to identify individuals and populations with, with, uh, with those deficiencies. For example, iron. We can look for iron deficiency anemia. We can look at uh, iron storage in the form of serum ferritin. We can look at hemoglobin concentration. We can look at serum transferrin receptor, uh, which transports iron into the cells, which is upregulated uh, up when iron, iron is deficient. For vitamin D, we can look for the presence of rickets or osteomalacia. We can measure uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D and see where that falls in terms of the recognized cutoff values as a diagnostic tool. For iodine, presence of goiter is a classic clinical manifestation, a swelling of the thyroid gland, and we can also measure urine iodine concentration. So we have tools, we have diagnostic tests. However, type 2 nutrients are a little bit more complex. 
let's look at zinc as our example. On a population level, we can look at the rate of stunting in children, which is indicative of a lack of zinc in the diet, as well as other nutrients. We can look at the incidence of upper respiratory tract infection or diarrhea, again, indicative of zinc deficiency, but not unique to zinc. We can look at plasma zinc concentration, and we can debate that one, and perhaps we will later on. And we, look, we can look at the population dietary zinc intake to give an in indication as to whether the population is meeting the recommendations. On an individual level, well, we have um, some uh, clinical evidence from uh, individuals suffering from acrodermatitis enteropathica, which is a, a genetic disorder affecting zinc absorption. And infants born with this condition have a very characteristic scaly skin rash around the mouth and the nose. However, this, this severe form of zinc deficiency is very rare and not normally seen uh, in, in populations. But it does give some clue as to what severe deficiency looks like. Again, we can look at plasma zinc concentration to see whether the individual uh, has a level that meets uh, the cutoff of 660 micrograms per litre, whatever your cutoff uh, you decide to use. You can look at hay, hair and nails to see the zinc concentration there, although um, that, that is somewhat controversial. And more recently, uh, studies have indicated that even with small changes in dietary zinc intake, you can look for evidence of changes in the DNA damage uh, using the comet assay. I'll come back to that later on. So what strategies can we employ to improve micronutrient intake? And broadly speaking, there are four strategies uh, that have been used. Supplementation, fortification, diet diversification, and biofortification. And I'm going to talk a little about each of those. So supplementation, that's been around for a long time. It is clearly um, a very effective strategy uh, if used uh, in a targeted way. And there are a number of systematic reviews that show the effectiveness. Uh, just pulled out a couple of examples here. One here, uh, iron status um, by Casgrain et al, published some time ago, showing the, um, the effectiveness of um, increasing iron intake through supplementation uh, in a, in a, a meta-analysis and, and, uh, and systematic review. Similarly, for zinc, looking as an outcome measure, looking at growth, there are a number of studies that have demonstrated the, the benefits of, of providing zinc supplements to children on their growth and development. Again, a number of systematic reviews have repeatedly demonstrated that. So we know that supplementation works. However, it is expensive and not suitable for population level interventions. So we could look at fortification, which is the addition of micronutrients to foods during food processing, or the addition of micronutrients to a meal directly in the form of sprinkles, for example, before the meal is consumed. One good example of a, six, of, of a fortification success story is iodine, but quality assurance and quality control monitoring for, for uh, fortification strategies must be effective. If we look at this figure here, which shows the global um, experience with salt iodization, very successful strategy around the world. This slide shows the percent of households currently consuming iodized salt, um, which has uh, had a major impact on iodine deficiency diseases in, in a positive sense. However, back to the question about monitoring and quality assurance, I just want to share a cautionary tale from our own research in Pakistan. We undertook a um, program uh, in a rural community, uh, a poor rural community, where iodized salt was available in the local bazaar, but not commonly purchased because it was a few rupees more expensive than the regular non-iodized salt. So we undertook a education program uh, in the community, going door to door, house to house, in the, in the health center, in the schools, promoting the benefits of using iodized salt for prevention of uh, iodine deficiency disease. 
Cutting a long story short, the education program was very successful and we monitored the sales of iodized salt in the local bazaar. The sales went up uh, in response to the education program. However, when we monitored the uh, iodine, uh, urinary iodine concentration in children attending the local schools, we didn't see any impact at all on, on this uh, biomarker for iodine status over a period of time. And we were scratching our heads as to why that could be until we made a visit to a local um, a factory making iodized salt. And, uh, and, and this picture is what we found. One example, I'm sure, of many, where you can see the little white tube at the top of that first photograph. This is where the iodine solution was dripped onto the rock salt uh, below in the basket, which was then uh, hand ground and put into bags labelled iodized salt and sold. No quality assurance, no quality control. Clearly, some of the bags would have contained iod some iodine, many bags, none, and, and no monitoring of the levels present. So, Fortification programs on a, on a national scale really do need the infrastructure and the government's support to make sure that the amount added is correct and that that's monitored carefully. Just a few words about dietary diversity. Um, low diet diversity associated with micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, diet diversity can be assessed using a number of tools. This is an example of one. This is a questionnaire called the Minimum Dietary Diversity Score for Women. Uh, it assesses the frequency of consumption of various foods within different food groups and the idea is that uh, if uh, the individual uh, achieves a threshold score of 5 out of 10, um, you can say that their dietary diversity is acceptable. Below that, it hasn't reached that minimum threshold. We uh, applied this tool to a study, uh, again, in, in Pakistan in um, postmenopausal women. The food groups labeled 1 to 10 on the left-hand side of this table are the, are the food groups that we assessed using a 24-hour recall technique. And on the right-hand side are some examples of the foods consumed by this population within each of those groups. This slide just shows what we found. And again, the, the font perhaps is a little too, too small to see, but just to, to summarize, we, we uh, did the 24-hour recalls on, on five separate occasions and, and assessed the, the diet diversity score. Virtually, well, all of the women consumed cereals, cereals and grains at all of the five time points. Very few of the women consumed other groups, such as the nuts, uh, uh, nuts and seeds um, and, and, and meat products. So di diversity of the diet, for, well, there was between 26% and 41% of the women, depending on the time point, actually achieved the minimum diet diversity score. Uh, and in this population, there's a very high prevalence of uh, zinc deficiency. So there's an association between low, low diet diversity and micronutrient deficiencies. And, and many other studies have demonstrated the same. So improving diet diversity through education, through um, uh, ensuring a supply of affordable uh, foods is one other strategy that can be employed to improve hidden hunger. I'd like to finish by focusing on biofortification. And this is the enhancement of the nutrient content of the crop through traditional selective breeding techniques or genetic modification and or agronomic techniques such as uh, the application of nutrient-rich fertilizers. This has been a, a large success story for Harvest Plus who use traditional breeding methods, not genetically modified techniques. They have produced um, a vitamin A rich maize uh, in Zimbabwe, iron rich beans in Uganda, zinc rich wheat and rice in Bangladesh. The scale up of these biofortification strategies depends on a number of factors. Firstly, evidence. We need evidence from effectiveness tri trials and efficacy trials. We also need to be sure that the crop that is produced is acceptable both to farmers in terms of its productivity and yield, but also to consumers who understand uh, the, the health benefits and actually want to buy the product. And it's also important for scale up once you have the evidence to engage with policy makers to, uh, to uh, provide that information in, in a, an accessible format uh, to, to facilitate the scale up. We've recently undertaken a, uh, the first evaluation of a, 
Harvest Plus produced um, zinc by a fortified wheat in Pakistan called the Busy Fed Trial. It had three work packages. The first one was an effectiveness trial, a, a, a randomized controlled trial to see whether consuming flour made from the biofortified wheat can impact on zinc status. The second work package was led by my colleague at the University of Notting Nottingham, Professor Martin Broadley, who looked at how the crop performed under different soil conditions, uh, organic matter within the soil, and also different fertilizer regimes and undertook a mapping exercise of soil conditions across 720 different sites across Punjab province, which is the main growing, uh, wheat growing region of Pakistan. And the third package was all about the consumer and farmer acceptability. I'm just going to share some early data with you. Uh, we are, the, the, study, the trial is complete, but we're just analyzing data uh, at the moment. This is the design of the RCT, um, complicated, complicated design, and the big red bit in the middle indicates where COVID came along and interrupted the RCT. But to summarize, the wheat, the biofortified wheat was grown locally, the seed was given to local farmers, and they were supported in growing the wheat by a fertilizer company, Fauci Fertilizer Company, one of our partners, uh, to successfully produce the biofortified crop. The design, we had 500 households, uh, a, a long phase one, which was a, a stabilization period where everybody received standard flour, every household received standard flour, non-biofortified, which was extended because of COVID. Um, phase two was a six month intervention trial where half of the households continued on the control flour and half of the households received the zinc biofortified flour. We looked, we focused on adolescent girls, and we looked at some um, biomarkers of zinc status. I mentioned before that plasma zinc concentration is somewhat problematic. Uh, we also looked at uh, DNA fragmentation. We looked at fatty acid uh, profiles and ratios. We looked at hair analysis as well using uh, a novel technique, X-ray fluorescence, that can measure the amount of zinc in a single hair at the very root of the hair where it emerges from the scalp. So what do we find? I can, I can share with you as much as, as we know so far. When we analyzed the flour uh, milled from our wheat, we did see a significant uh, uplift in the amount of zinc uh, in that flour from 17.0 for, uh, for the galaxy flour, which is the control flour, and this is in milligrams per kilogram, up to 20.7 in the uh, biofortified flour. We also saw an increase in the amount of iron in the flour as well, which uh, was interesting. Uh, no change in the, in the copper um, and, a, and, a, and a change in the selenium as well. This translated, if we focus on the zinc, um, this, well, zinc and iron, this translated it into a, an increase in zinc and iron from the flour, which is used to, to make bread, and bread is consumed with every, every meal of around 21% uh, for, for zinc. This is an uplift of 1.5 milligrams a day for zinc and 1.2 milligrams a day for iron. Small amounts, but over a period of time uh, could accumulate to have a positive effect. But what have we found? Well, not so much to share with you so far, but looking at plasma zinc concentrations, no surprise there. This small increase in intake really didn't have any impact at all on plasma zinc concentration, uh, which we, we were not surprised by. But we did see a small but significant increase in the storage, um, in, 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 in uh, serum ferritin, uh, in, an increase in, in serum ferritin. Preliminary data indicate that in terms of DNA fragmentation, we are seeing some positive trends. Um, similarly, with fatty acid ratios, we're, we're seeing some uh, small positive trends there. Uh, and single hair analysis, again, some small positive trends there. But whether they turn out to be trends or whether they turn out to be significant changes, we will have to wait to find out. And we're also looking at the prevalence uh, of the uh, upper respiratory tract infection and diarrhea in infants as well throughout the, the study. Again, data still being analyzed. I'd just like to finish by talking a little, little bit about work package three, which was around the community and producers 
producers' perceptions of the, of the flower uh, and whether it's acceptable or not to them. We undertook a number of focus groups with uh, members of the community, including the local jerga, who are the community elders, um, to find out their views and thoughts about uh, biofortified flour and whether or not, if it was available on the market, they would actually buy it. I just want to leave you with some quotes um, from our community partners, which highlight some of the concerns they had at the beginning of the study, and, and that might prove to be barriers um, if they're not addressed, uh, if, if the biofortification, well, it is being scaled up, but it, it highlights the importance of addressing these concerns with community members. This uh, male participant say, said, people used to say it's a birth control. It does this and it does that. And there was some fear in our hearts as well. But now we don't have that fear. And if this flower becomes available in our village, we will buy it with great confidence. And that really speaks to the amount of work that was done by our implementation partners uh, and the high level of trust that exists between the researchers and the community members that um, has been able to allay some of these concerns. This female said we would try to buy this flower. Uh, it is good flower. It does not leave any bad impact on one's health, but it's a matter of affordability. Everybody looks at, the, everybody looks at affordability. So she has her eye on the purse strings, and clearly um, that the cost is, is, is an important factor. But this male uh, participant says we will definitely try to buy this flower because it's benefited our body, and it will save us money in medicine, even if it is 20 rupees more expensive, we will buy it. So he has his eye on the long-term, the long-term potential health benefits of uh, increasing uh, zinc intake through this, this mechanism. So what are my take-home messages? Um, well, what are the main concerns? Well, big concern, we are off track to meet the nutrition targets globally. Um, high food quality, not just quantity, is needed to address uh, micronutrient deficiencies. And this is particularly pertinent when we think about how we um, address um, food supplies uh, in, in this era of climate change. How do we identify hidden hunger in, in individuals? Well, the classic tools, anthropometry, dietary assessment, uh, clinical um, assessment, coupled with appropriate biochemical challenges, uh, tests are, are used, but this is clearly a challenge for the type two nutrients, uh, including zinc, as I mentioned earlier. Novel biobarkers are very much needed. And how do we address it? Well, um, it is no magic bullet, as we referred to earlier today. It's about complementary strategies. There's a place for supplementation, for food fortification, and improving dietary diversity where it is possible. Biofortification of staples is potentially a low-cost, sustainable approach which benefits a population at scale. But we really do need more evidence from effectiveness trials to inform this scale-up. And clearly, uh, acceptability of this approach to food producers and consumers is central for its success. I'd just like to finish by acknowledging the fantastic team I've been working with over the last a decade or so uh, on a number of these studies we've been uh, conducting in, in northwest Pakistan. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lowe. Could I now invite uh, Mike Lean and Professor Satman to join us for the question and answer? Do you want to take a seat? Mike, you can stand and use the mic here. Would that work okay? Use, use this mic and okay. perhaps take a seat. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We, we, we'll, we'll, we'll make a start, and if the seat comes, it comes. So, questions for any of our three speakers this afternoon? Yes, please. First of all, I'd like to thank all three true speakers, three speakers for their uh, amazing presentations. I have a question for Mike, and uh, he. I understand that the, the limiting the calories and tapering it down to 850 is working, absolutely working. It's almost, it's, it's just like a cure. But it is very near starving. <laughs> how people cope with that. Because I, I have difficulty when I'm doing it with 1,500 
and I can't think about that much low so the, the question is uh, how close is 850 calories a day to starving yes well um, we we chose 850 calories a day because in in Europe under European law below 800 calories is considered very low calorie diet so this is not a very low calorie diet and that tells you it's not close to starving um, it's also possible for a dietitian to design using ordinary foods a nutritionally complete diet with about 800 calories a day. And the examples I showed here with the, our Scottish no doubts diet, that is again 850 calories a day with very simple, very popular foods and the same for the Nepali diet. People who follow these programs um, don't feel hungry. These, we're talking now about people who are overweight and obese and they, the interesting thing is they did not complain of hunger. They complained of boredom because they're accustomed to having many different foods with different colors and silver paper and cartoon figures on the wrapping. And they don't get that. So they complained a little bit about boredom, but not about being hungry. So it's not near starvation, no. And nor is it near hidden, hidden hunger because it had all the vitamins and minerals complete. And, then and just maybe I can add to that. Uh, I think the experience of the participants was the challenges were not with the uh, initial weight loss phase. They coped with that remarkably well. The challenges was, was when we reintroduced normal foods and how would they manage to maintain their weight loss when they now had access to lots of other foods. So the 850 calories was, was not a challenge as Mike said, it worked extremely well. In, in fact, can I just add to that, many patients asked to continue longer with the formula diet because they were uh, frightened about having to choose foods and they knew if they choose the wrong foods then their weight will increase. Thank you very much. Julian. Well I think the whole session was really inspiring. Everyone gave such a wonderful presentation. I think in the case of the, uh, the work that Mike and you and, and the team has done, it's the most convincing example of reversal of a disease state that I've ever come across and I'm sure anyone has ever come across. My question to you then is how have you been able to condense your work down to something that the average family practitioner, nurse or dietitian can implement with their subjects? In, in a sense, we didn't have to condense anything because this study was conducted entirely by ordinary general practitioners. It wasn't even the doctors, it was the practice nurse or dietitian if one is available. So all the materials and intervention were available uh, to ordinary doctors, ordinary nurses, ordinary dietitians, and accessible to, to ordinary people in the population. And as I mentioned, the program now, the same program is delivered remotely uh, by a central delivery by, by post and using um, very simple um, modern techniques like telephone. Um, the telephone was invented by a Scotsman. I have to remind the world of this. The telephone has last found its place. Blame for a lot. <laughs> has last found its place in medicine because it allows me as a doctor or a dietitian to telephone to speak to somebody and give a very personal yeah. support. And that is how we make it make it work in real life. And it's mm. it's now working for many thousands of people across the country. Not just with the same, not just with the Counterweight Plus, but with many other programs which are using the same technique. And is Diabetes UK um, helping to implement it across the country? Um, well, Diabetes UK almost bankrupted itself by funding the direct trial, and then yes. came along COVID, and of course everybody stops giving donations to charities. So Diabetes UK has worked That's extremely sad. hard, and I think it's not the job of Diabetes UK to continue this work uh, in, across the country. This is, yeah. this is now down to our health services, and we have... Well. Uh, in the UK, we have uh, four health services, and they all work slightly differently, exactly. but they are supporting remission. It's come under the same banner as prevention, which is a little bit confusing. So we now have, in Scotland at least, a diabetes prevention and remission program with a single uh, funding, which goes to the different regions. And they then decide how much of the funding to put into primary prevention efforts and how much to put into remission. Mm -hmm. And it's, in, in a way, it's easier to understand remission because we know the numbers, we know the proportion yes. who can achieve 
um, 10, 15 kilogram weight loss, and we know how many will get remissions. With prevention, um, really we don't have a good model, and this goes back to the earlier discussions, that obesity prevention has not been achieved in any country for a population. And type 2 diabetes is part of obesity. It's not a separate. Mm. Type 2 diabetes is not an endocrine disease, not a primary endocrine disease. It's a, a nutritional disease, and it's part of obesity. So we're back to the same yeah. problem there. Fantastic. Can you indulge me with one more quick question for Professor Satman? I feel it's something that's been <laughs> playing on my mind ever since the presentation, and that is that Turkey is the only country where... Uh, women have a higher level of obesity than men in, and yet in Turkey still uh, women live significantly longer than men. Do you um, have the concept of disability adjusted life years in Turkey and uh, are women subject to higher dailies than men or is there something very unfair about the whole situation? <laughs> Uh, it's completely related, I think, uh, with the lifestyle habits. Um, uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, during the uh, younger and middle age, uh, the uh, women uh, used to work hard, having, uh, I mean, more uh, child, uh, without giving the, I mean, uh, weight uh, gain. Uh, they become pregnant again. And uh, until the menopausal age, the life is going on. But after the menopausal age, uh, it's again culturally, uh, they uh, gain some, I mean, let's say, importance in the family. Uh, they can have their relatives, their daughters or uh, daughter-in-law, uh, taking care of the daily duty. And there is no more, I mean, uh, going after the, uh, I mean, uh, kids and so, uh, and no, no more household uh, work. So uh, that's why uh, they uh, eat the, than that they used to, but they, uh, I mean, don't have the habit of uh, physical activity, and they s sit and have a household, let's say, um, uh, some meetings with full of foods. <laughs> so, because they are happy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Begum. Yeah, thank you very much for this really, really inspiring session. Uh, it's really in interesting and I'm sure the participants all enjoyed well. So I have a question to Professor Love. So um, I, we heard that there are uh, ways of uh, fortification. Uh, one of them is supplement, the other one was um, uh, biofortification, and the other one was, uh, just remind me, the th third one. Yes. Actually, uh, it seems like the most promising one is the biofortification. So are there, maybe there are some uh, pluses and negative ways of it, but are there any uh, one single country who adopted a into a, uh, their national program, the biofortification of any of the supplements? I think um, of the strategies, biofortification is the most recent. Um, I think we're still in the phase of gathering evidence. That, I mean, it is, being, it is being scaled up in various countries around the world, and there have been success stories, uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, around vitamin A-rich maize um, in Zimbabwe. Um, so yeah, the, the evidence is gathering. Um, we still need more evidence to, to give the, the scale up a boost. I mean, it, um, it does have the advantage of, of being sustainable in as much as once the crop has been developed, uh, it can then be grown year on year, um, and, and the power is put into the hands of, of the farmers themselves rather than having to rely on external um, factors. So I do agree with you. I think biofortification potentially is the most powerful and sustainable strategy, but yeah, more evidence needed. Thank you very much. We have a question in the middle. 
So thank you for the organizing uh, this conference and thank you for the speakers. Uh, I really enjoy it. So my question is uh, to Professor Ilhan. Um, you give some estimation uh, about type 2 diabetes and obesity numbers. So uh, do you consider uh, COVID-19 effect when you're giving those uh, estimation? Because uh, I think that uh, most of the studies done in the Turkish population show that COVID-19 and its effect on lifestyle um, half of the population gain weight. Uh, so, do you consider uh, this effect? Uh, I should consider, but at the moment I don't have uh, enough. I mean, uh, data for that. How uh, much they gain weight? But I'm sure we should consider about that uh, in our uh, daily clinical practice. We are aware of that problem. And if we can, I mean, uh, conclude uh, and uh, go to the field again, we will see the real situ situation, I think. Yeah, I hope. Uh, also, one more question. Um, you show uh, many project and program is going on in mm -hmm. Turkey, especially in Istanbul as well. Uh, so, do you think that we overlook one any places because you know the numbers are increasing? Turkey is in the top on mm -hmm. the list. So, do you think we overlook any of the practical places that we couldn't really touch public health? Well, Thank you. you might be right. Thank you uh, again for the question. Uh, but uh, I couldn't mention about it. Uh, there was a, a I mean, good, uh, I mean, program uh, called Obesis, and uh, it was a pilot program started just before the uh, pandemic, and then they uh, interrupted. I think they uh, stopped. But it was a good program, uh, like uh, obesity intervention. Uh, there have uh, some uh, sub, uh, I mean, uh, area like your uh, study, I mean, with very low calorie diet and uh, some part with physical activity and social lifestyle and uh, changing behavioral, uh, I mean, uh, things. Uh, I mean, uh, after uh, September, I heard about from the uh, Minister of Health, they will start again and we will see, but definitely we need a national strategy with, uh, in case of, I mean, small, small studies, we have to uh, develop a national approach with one uh, solution, I think. So thank you. As a dietitian, I feel like uh, we are focused on mostly on physical activity for the program and really overlook the di diet part. So if you like um, really access the nutritional consultation for public, it will really impact our numbers, I think. I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. The lady here in the middle. Thank you so much uh, for the opportunity that uh, I was given. Um, in the morning session, we heard about the status of uh, Turkish population. This is a general uh, question uh, that I want to pose. And we heard the effect of COVID-19 on our immune system and the health. But uh, during COVID, I think there, uh, there was an emerging businesses, especially in the field of nutrition and in the field of micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, also in the afternoon, I think there was a session about hidden hunger. Uh, some practices, uh, we can see that clinics were uh, encouraging intravenous feeding of micronutrient uh, like vitamins, minerals, and uh, the general population, they are connecting this with prevention and uh, prevention of COVID-19 and also enhancement of immune uh, system. However, we are not sure if there is any regulation or, or policies that will uh, really regulate these practices, uh, or if there is any awareness program for the general population to, uh, to just let them know that uh, this kind of practices may also contribute to toxicity from such uh, 
micronutrient uh, without any regulation. So I just want to see what's your insight. Uh, are, you uh, are you experiencing this uh, such practices in UK, uh, Finland, in Turkey, or it's just in the Gulf region? Professor Zatman, any experience from Turkey? Uh, well, personally, I have no experience because I was sitting uh, at the table, uh, on the table, uh, when, uh, during the, I mean, COVID pandemic. Uh, but uh, I know about some, uh, I mean, programs, small programs, of course, uh, dealing with the nutrition and uh, vitamin and uh, mineral, uh, I mean, deficiencies and uh, feeding that but I don't have uh, any idea about the official program. Uh, I didn't heard about that, sorry. Um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question, and, and I think it's one which, which we should debate under a, a different heading. In the evidence says, and we heard this morning, that if you are deficient in a micronutrient, and I mean seriously deficient, then it may impact the immune system. But in the general population, uh, very few people are deficient. There may be people with low level, and there's no evidence that taking supplements has any benefit. So uh, this has been a crowd belief, and I think it's, I think it's an interesting um, concept that when there is a, a disease and we don't have a solution, people immediately think, oh, we must be the diet. It must be food. It must be vitamins. It must be minerals. And it's a crowd belief, and it's like many other beliefs which are founded on some elements of, of information which have then been transferred to a new situation. So many people believed that vitamin D would solve COVID, and it doesn't. They believe vitamin, um, vitamins and minerals would, be, um, would prevent the disease or cure it or change the outcome. It doesn't, unless you are profoundly deficient, and that simply isn't, doesn't happen in our population. So most people in the UK do not take vitamin or mineral supplements. In America, they do because they have strange beliefs. Um, we won't talk about American politics now, but they do have some very strange beliefs. Our UK population do not take vitamins and minerals. Would you agree, John? Thanks, Mike. Uh, I mean, just a big question, and uh, um, just to comment on the American situation, the latest data I've seen is that 55% of adult Americans are taking vitamin mineral supplements and the vast, vast majority do not need them. It's a complete waste of time. Alison, last word from you. I was just going to perhaps correct the learned um, uh, Professor Lean over there that actually quite a lot of the UK population do take micronutrient supplements. It's surprisingly high. Um, and what we see is um, those with the best micronutrient status, best diets are the ones that we all know this, the health seekers are most likely to take um, supplements and um, absolutely agree though um, it's unlikely to be of any benefit to them at all and in unusual cases may do harm. <laughs> so. I, I, should, I should have said Scottish population. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, I think you find quite a lot of Scottish population. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We have a just, question. just for Turkey, uh, yes, it's increasing. And there are lots of uh, clinics each and every day. They start these drips. They prepare a mixture of minerals and vitamins. And uh, it's introduced intravenously. And especially in big cities, even the... Um, is it plastic surgeons, <laughs> even the plastic surgeon clinics are doing that. And this is to get usually combined with traditional medicinal uh, activities or dermatologists, plastic reconstructive uh, surgeons even, because it's very much combined with the beauty and uh, slowing the aging process. And it's really very much spreading out in Turkey as well. Thank you very much. It's very helpful to have that information. Do we have any further questions? One at the back. Can someone? Oh, you've got a mic. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is Latife. I have just one question for Mike. Uh, you already said participants were even willing to continue to diet, 
But I still wonder if, uh, if, he, the, if did the study involve any psychological intervention, like such as any motivational interviews, any psychological support to promote the adherence of the participants? Thank you. I think the question was whether the diet intervention was accompanied by behavioral strategies. Yeah. And the answer is very much yes. The, the, the dietary intervention program was designed over many years with input from psychologists, behavioral scientists, um, and behavioral change specialists using um, the theoretical based uh, approaches as well as a practical uh, experience of dietitians. So this was a composite program. And every dietitian uses behavioral change mechanisms. Every dietitian has to use them. Um, whether they uh, document exactly which, pr which process is used is, is uncertain, but I think every dietitian who is effective must use um, all the available psychological and behavioral change mechanisms, and that was included. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any more hands. Um, so. Thank you very much to all three speakers in this session. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who have asked questions and have been a fantastic audience. That brings us to the end of today's session. Begum, do you want to say anything about tomorrow? So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, today we are uh, f finishing the sessions. And tomorrow we will start at 10 o'clock uh, Turkish time. Uh, we hope to see you all, even from the distance or from face to face. Uh, you're welcome uh, to join us. Uh, by the way, please do not forget to raise your questions if you're vir virtually following the uh, conference online. So uh, all the questions will be gathered and at the end of the day tomorrow, uh, the, the chair of the roundtable discussion session will uh, try to raise them all. Uh, thank you again for joining us and hope to see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.